I told them once, I told them a hundred times. But spinal tap first and puppet show last. It's right. a morale builder, isn't it? Yeah. You've got a big dressing room, though. What? Uh, you know, you've got a big dressing room. Oh, we've got a bigger dressing room than the, the puppet, puppet show. So that's yeah. refreshing. Hello, welcome to Cindy Beef Podcast. I am your host, host with the not so most uh, Gary Hill. Uh, started this thing about eight years ago, and this is uh this is the result of it me on a microphone by myself. Uh, not really though. Th- this uh show will will bring many folks together that I'm excited for you to to hear their their voices. Most of the time, talk more than me, which is fine, because uh, the main crux of the show is to celebrate Chris per guest, and uh, that's that's what we're doing for for the most part, uh, with some little additional things for for you guys to to nosh on. Uh, and um, what can I say? Eight years, man. I I, I thought of doing this because um, some of the folks were, were I enjoyed what some other folks were doing, uh, but listening to their their shows and. Uh, I can name those shows here, but I'm not going to. Uh, one of which is not with us anymore. Uh, I have to mention him. J- Johnny Krug, uh, you're up there in horror movie heaven somewhere, whatever plane of existence you, you may be on, uh, whatever it is. No judgment here. But I listened to Kruger Nation first, and uh, I like to think that if it wasn't for that, you know, me enjoying. What Johnny did, you know, laying, laying, laying down what he used to do, you know, solo, which is hard enough to do as it is, uh, I wouldn't be as as exuberant as I am today. Because I don't know if you guys know this as a podcaster, I tell folks this often, you know, when you start out, your first 10 shows will probably be terrible because you don't have confidence on the microphone. That man had confidence on the microphone because he loved the content that he talked about. And when I started this thing, I said, you know what? There's lots of horror podcasts out there, and if I did just horror, I'd be just like the rest of them, and I, I like to single myself out. If you guys hear some of the programming on some of these shows, sometimes they're really off the wall. That's because, you know, my, my tiny brain gets going and the gears get moving and say, you know what, this would go together sort of well. Some folks will get it, some folks won't get it, but the, the joke lands with at least one person. I feel like doing my job as a podcaster. Uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll kick off this, this show. Usually we, we do what you've been watching. So I'm going to name a couple things that, that I have been watching and um, do small reviews of them. And these might be Patreon bonuses eventually of me doing um, a new horror film and something old that might be terrible because I like to torture myself and not torture, not torture others. So speaking of torturing myself, I, I did watch the new Ty West film, X. From this year, uh, I'm not normally a fan of Ty West. I, I think a lot of his slow burns do not work with me. And my favorite film of his is the one he denied, which is Cabin Fever 2, which is, I think, is a lot of fun. But um, the, that's the one that he denies, you know, any, you know, credit for that involvement. He knows he was involved in it. But if you... I haven't seen the previews. This is like a throwback movie that are, that are oh so popular nowadays. This is written, uh, directed, and produced by Ty West. Uh, stars Mia Goth, uh, Jenny Ortega, Brittany Snow, um, Kid C- Kid Cudi. I think you pronounce that guy's name. He's a rapper, but he's also accent things sometimes. Uh, and some some really kooky old folks. And um. A certain thing in the water that I'm not going to give away. <laughs> it makes it epic. Basically, you know, the the, the these this group of uh, people leave out to go. They they rent out this uh like farmhouse from these old folks because they're going to make a porno. People, you know, and they're they're going to get their names in, in lights or some shit like that. But uh, and of course things go awry. Uh, the old folks are really weird. Uh, but your cheap plot synopsis for this movie is, in 1979, a group of young filmmakers set up to make an adult film in rural, t- rural Texas. But when their reclu- reclusive elderly hosts catch them in the act, the cast find themselves fighting for their lives. That's yes and no the plot, because uh, the, the the couple in, in question, uh, Nana's a little frisky, but uh, Daddy's a little w- weirded out that he might have a heart attack if he gets frisky. So 
there's a pl- plot in here where she finds out what they're doing, and she's like, well, I'm going to get some of that. And, you know, she just goes on a crazy killing spree. And I, I should have said spoilers before that, but I'm sorry. But there, there's more to it than that. And there's... I, I, I'll stop my, my, my spoilers there, but I, I, I'll give uh, I'll give uh, some some raw you know generalizations general, generalizations about this movie. What I do, what I think it does right. Um, a lot of these horror films come out now that are sort of like the member berries of horror films. I mean, if you watch any Rob Zombie film, you could tell where his inspiration came from. You could tell where Ty West's imp- uh, inspiration came from. This movie too is the same kind of films, but. He doesn't, and my friend made a good point, he, he liked the film because it felt more like uh, Toby Hooper's Eaten Alive rather than rather than um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is just about every film that uh, Rob Zombie's ever made has either been Texas Chainsaw Massacre or in Lord of Salem's uh, realm, uh, The Sentinel mixes some other stuff. And what, what Ty West does so well here is that he doesn't take d- direct everything from everything he's, he's having fun with these characters although I don't like these characters all that much I, I, I was hoping for Brittany Snow to die as soon as you know she started talking about making the fake moaning orgasms and uh, the icing on the cake is the black guy with an acoustic guitar her singing Fleetwood Mac song on a couch I'm like yeah I just this girl needs to die and spoilers I get my wish <laughs> but um the gore is incredible uh, you know, poke in the eye, full frontal male n- nudity and female nudity. If you, I hear a lot of folks complain about that. Oh, there's uh, all this female nudity, but no male nudity. You got you got hanging dong in this movie, and not not the one you want to see. But uh, it, it's it's pretty gross. But um, the end is really satisfying. You know, there there's one there's one uh, you know there, there's a survivor and. You know the 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 conclusion is is really amazing. Um, they talk about you know them making a prequel. Apparently, there's an end credit sequence that I did not see where they set it up for the prequel. I guess to tell the origin of this old couple, and I don't need to know that. I would rather go unknowing what's going on. But I think Kyle had it right. It feels more like eating alive. Like these people have taken folks in to their uh, their boarding house. In multiple times and kill this has happened before with with the the him and the wife you know having to you know do stuff and you know like I said if you have a CNX and you're a novice A24 fan like myself I can take it or leave it certain things are wonderful I think a majority of it is pompous bullshit but um this is this is pretty sly pretty in your face Gore and I, you got, I gotta love gore for gore's sake. It didn't play punches. It, it really took that R rating and said, you know what, we're, we're gonna give you something the world looks like fucking hamburger meat mixed with you know red dye number five and possibly some caro syrup, just to make you really, really make you really see that 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 visceral, you know, yeah, you know, I loved it. I loved it. this is uh this is his best work I think. I mean, f- fuck the innkeepers I, I, and and you know, a couple other things he made. I I, I feel this is his best work because I'm not a huge fan of the slow burn when it doesn't work for me. I I watch a slow burn when it does work, but this this you know like like I think you wait a good forty five minutes for the first kill, but when it hits, it fucking hits you like a like a ton of bricks, and you're like, yeah, it, this this is the film for me. So uh, X. If I had to give it a rating right now without watching it, watching it again, I only watched it once. Um, eight out of ten, I, I gotta say, and that's that's a lot saying for me in Ty West stuff. You go go watch it. Um, the next thing I watched, and uh, <laughs> this this is the the questionable one that I wasn't sure if I was gonna like it or not. We we discussed this film briefly on um, the gore uh, commentary. Okay, for if you listen to the last two Jigman commentaries, we put one off for Gore. And um the director that we directed Children of the Corn, he directed Tough Turf, and he directed also this film, which I talk about right now, called Winners Take All, which is it sounds, you know, really and it is, I'll tell you right now, here we go. 
The scene is a modern 1980s arena where present-day gladiators compete in the wild sports extravaganza of Supercross. Winner takes all, mixes the rivalry and the camaraderie of two young men with a thrill of spectacular driving and high-stakes competition. Going beyond the drama and excitement of, a race, of the racing scene, a cast of hot, talented newcomers of, of young love, uh, no one can feel left out of the thrill of victory on the track and off. That sounds like somebody really loved this movie a lot. And uh, just to give you a quick, 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 I had to look at this real fast. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, no? Okay, well, this is something. Uh, <laughs> the guy that helped write this movie, Christopher W. Christopher W. Knight, which is not Christopher Knight for the Brady Bunch, executive produced Hot Dog the Movie, which is, um, which is a sex comedy from the 80s. But this star is Don Michael Paul of, um, sounds very familiar to me. He was, um, he did a lot of writing and stuff. I'm sorry. He didn't, he didn't star in a lot of stuff. His, his name sounded very familiar, so I apologize for, for my, uh, talking right there. Uh, <laughs> Courtney Gaines shows up in this movie as, as our, our hero, Rick Mellon's friend. He, he's the star of this picture. Uh, and so, so does Peter DeLuise. <laughs> you you may know uh, Courtney Gaines from working with Franz Kirsch in 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 uh, Children's Court. Of course, he was uh, Malachi. If you guys didn't didn't know that, uh, Kathleen York as Judy McCormick is his squeeze that uh, goes for his buddy Robert Kranz uh, as Bad Billy Robinson. Uh, there, there's some other folks. This also stars Tony Longo as, as uh, Baron Nolan, which is a, a fun character because he's basically like this goon who also who's also in the motocross race who has much, much more of a uh, role in the um, f- finale of the, the big motocross race in Texas. And somebody shows up in this film, uh, Kat- Kathleen Kinmont, who was the bride of Reanimator. And she was also in Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers. She plays a spectator in this movie. She's not in much of it, but um, I thought it was fun that I saw her in the credits, so I would mention her, because people know who she is. Uh... This film, have you seen Rad, people? Because it's kind of like Rad. It's basically, Billy plays. The, I mean, uh, Rick Mellon is this guy who who um, is it lives in a small town where his his best friend in, in motocross, uh, in a sense, Bad Billy, uh, went to go to the bigs. He went to go go on the circuit. Well, he comes back to town for this race, and they um, become they get reacquainted. And unfortunately, Bad Billy gets reacquainted with uh, his girl again, because that used to be used to be Bad Billy's girl. And of course, R- Rick scooped in when when she when he you know ducked out of town. So <laughs> Rick Rick loses the, the the race, but he he decides uh, to go race in Dallas at like this big. It's a Texas state. It, it's really cool. It's filmed at Texas Stadium. This whole big motocross, you know, race scene, and to try to win some pride back, I guess, from Bad Billy and, and, and his ex-girl, uh, bringing his buddy along, buddies along the way, uh, Peter DeLuise and Courtney Gaines, who is uh, Wally Br- Br- Briskin and uh, Courtney Gaines, but the character called Goose Trammel, and these guys are fun too, they're, they're like the buddies that help them, you know, do maintenance on the bike, and he has another girl that comes along for the ride, Cindy, who's like a like an ace mechanic. And of course, in the end, they're going to get together because it's that kind of movie. Um, they have the race. The race gets all messed up, so they have, of course, another race in the mountains to see who's got the biggest motocross stick there is. And they, you know, it's it's got crazy motocross stunts in it. But the big problem, I you, you, why I say watch Rad before you watch this movie, is because Rad has the soundtrack. Rad has much better directed bike stunts because it's directed by Hal Needham, for Christ's sake. You know, uh, uh, ace, you know, stunt coordinator as it is di- behind in the directing chair. And this film is kind of corny, and, and and not in the sense of whatever. It's just like, how do I say this? It's it's like absorbently masculine in a lot of ways. And there's a line in this movie that Billy tells his teammates because he has he's he's part of like a three man team, <clears throat> much like Inrad, <laughs> where he says, "You know why my name's printed on my ass, so you know who to follow." 
So it's like really, really masculine and probably a little bit of homo- homoerotic too. I, I don't know. It, it's there. And uh, all, all in all, you know, I wish there was a better copy of this movie out there, but you, you can find this on YouTube. I don't think anywhere else but like VHS. But I, I had a, a decent time with this movie. It was definitely a piece of the era of uh, 1980s, you know, stunt biking and, you know, overall dude bro moments is full of that and uh mvp of this film is just big dumb don't big dumb tony longo and his his crazy action uh just flipping over bikes and knocking people over and there's a guy in here uh who's uh bad billy's sponsor <laughs> who looks like a crossing rick flair and ba- uh, uncle baby billy from the righteous gemstones and it's kind of fucking magical so look out for that guy too. Um, like I said, it's on YouTube. I'm gonna put the um, the link in the show notes of this episode so you guys could could check it out if you would like to. Uh, God, look at the crest. It's like a real family affair. Some of the actors have the same last name as the crew, and so I guess that's how they uh, how they got into it. I guess. <laughs> but winners take all from the year of the of 1987. I don't say the year of our Lord. Directed by Fritz Kirsch. You guys should go check it out if you guys like this sort of thing. If you're not into this sort of thing, you know, crazy bike stunts and stuff and dude bro moments. And and if you like rad, you might like this movie, but this is a lesser rad in my opinion. Uh, go check out Winners Take All. You got you got 90 minutes to lose on YouTube. I don't know. But here we are. We're going to get to the meat and potatoes of this episode, uh, which is two, two, two films that... Uh, in the in the first uh, etching of Chris Guest's career, uh, he only directed five films, but we had to get that sixth film in. I think you guys know which one I'm talking about because it couldn't happen, it wouldn't happen without it. Uh, right now, you will hear myself, you will hear Suzanne, you will hear Ricky Morgan, and my brother Jeffrey X Martin doing this is Spinal Tap. The OG, the one that started the mockumentary style of CRISPR Guest. Not right about CRISPR Guest, mind you. But um, right after, yeah, <laughs> you will hear the review right now. Through two decades, 17 classic albums, countless unforgettable concert triumphs, they changed the face of British rock music forever. And the best part is, they're back. Now, they're on the verge of the greatest comeback of all time. Rock and roll. This is their moment. All right, straight through this door here, down the hall. Yeah. Turn right. Their time has come. Rock and roll. Any minute now. Any second. Hello, stage. I feel we're lost. There's a little jog there. About 30 no. feet. A little jog to the no. left. Get ready. Get oh, set. Oh, Heavy metal's deep. You can get stuff out of it. My name is Marty DeBerge. I'm a filmmaker. One man dares to probe the hidden secrets. I was just pointing at it. I well, don't point even. You don't even point. point. No, it can't be played. Never. I mean, what can I look at? Up. One man dares to hear the shocking answers. It's tragic, really. He exploded on stage. To questions like, is the world really ready for spinal tap? You put a greased, naked woman yes. on all fours yes. with a dog collar with around dog collar. her neck and a leash. And a leash. And pushing a black glove in her face to sniff it. You don't find that offensive? No, You don't, don't. find that sexist? Well, you should Listen have seen the cover they wanted to do. Of vicious gossip. The official explanation was he choked on vomit. Well, I can't yes. prove whose vomit it was. Years of ugly rumors. It's a passion. This is a fact. And you are yes. spinal tarp? Oh, what's going on here? Hi. Now, the vicious, ugly truth can be told. Well, I'm sure I'd feel much worse if I weren't under such heavy sedation. In 
to America. From the place where eardrums go to die come the living legends of rock and roll lunacy. This is Spinal Tap. You know, it's like Hemingway said, you know, remember them as they were and write them off. Yes, we're back with our first review of the night. And boy, howdy, is is it quite a review. And um, I'll start that with by saying who's on this review. Besides myself, my big-ass fucking mouth. Uh, Suzanne's here. How you doing, girl? Hey, how is everybody tonight? Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, also with me, uh, the guy you'll hear later on in the show, and... Um, you may know him from Hail Ming, but you may also know him as a guy that, that sits between the drums, and the, I mean, between the, the bass player and the guitar player of a band <laughs> called Midlife Crisis. If you know, if you know that band, you know. Uh, Rick Morgan is here. How you doing, sir? If you know that band, you really need a life. Do it. <laughs> hey, hey, you, I'm excited, you, excited to be here. Can't wait to talk about Mr. No Legs. <laughs> do it. <laughs> you look happy behind those drums. That's all I'm saying, man, you know. Oh, man, it's, yeah, it's it's better than most things in life. <laughs> and with us, the guy he says going to be us, we be very disappointed if he didn't show up, but um, yeah, this is a review that I never intended to do with anybody else, so he's here. I believe he's he's a bass player. He he might play with random accoutrements, not a pick, though, uh, or his fingers. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey X. Martin, how you doing, sir? I'm doing well. Look, I'd love to hang out and talk with you guys, but I need to go into the lobby and sit and wait for the limousine. <laughs> Fucking Hessman. Uh, Liam. Ian. 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 Yes. <laughs> Fucking Hessman. You know, he's in this movie. You know, okay. God bless Johnny Fever and all of his glory. But we're here to talk about a very special film uh, that's not directed by... One CRISPR guest, but you, you cannot, you can't not include it in this in this legion of reviews here. Uh, this is Spinal Tap uh, from 1984, the, what kicked off the the CRISPR guest mockumentary train, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, directed by Meathead Rob Reiner in his directorial debut. This stars, oh man, it stars some stars, don't it, man? I'm gonna do it right now. Michael McKeon as David St. Hubbins. Christopher Guest as Nigel Tufnell, Harry Shearer as Derek Smalls, Rob Reiner himself as Martin Marty DeBerge, uh, Tony Hendra as Ian Faith, oh there's so many, R.J. Parnell, one of the drummers uh, uh, for Atomic Rooster, uh, for a drummer for Atomic Rooster as Mick Shrimpton, that sounds weird, Wikipedia, there we go. Uh, <laughs> Your name some other ones. June Chadwick as as your Yoko in this group. Uh, Janine, um, Bruno Kirby shows up. Ed Bagley Jr. shows up as John Stumpy Peppies. You should know that by now. Come on now. It's it's uh, <laughs> love that shit, man. Uh, our mime waiters, legendary Dana Carvey and and, and one Billy Crystal. You know, because mime is money, of course. <laughs> I, there's so many names to mention in, in this cast list, but I'm sure we're gonna get to most of them. But um. It, 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 it's it's very fun. Um, if you don't know the story of this, Spinal Tap is a uh, a real slash fictional band because they do play their own instruments and they, they, they do sing these songs that within this movie and within everywhere else are going back on a U.S. tour after six years and they have this filmmaker following with them and they want to promote their album Smell the Glove, you know, but they're 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 supposedly washed up but I, we still like them, and whatever, man, they get all kinds of pro- tr- trouble, you know, as, as rock bands do. I'm, I'm told my friends who are who are musicians that parts of this is hard to watch because it's all it's all true, getting lost backstage and stuff, and you know. Hello, Cleveland. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I'll kick it to my, my brother. From uh, Tennessee, and that, that's hard to say. They're both in Tennessee. Um, let's start with X. X, what's up, man? Tell us about it. Well, I think there's not a whole lot you can say about this is Spinal Tap that hasn't been said literally hundreds of thousands of times before. But it's one of those rare movies that manages to be a perfect 
snapshot of the times in which it was created while still escaping those cultural bonds and wacky fashions and haircuts to become this timeless and beloved movie an actual uh, and i hate the word but it's a classic and that's a it's it's that word is used far too much but these characters are wonderfully drawn even if the story such as it is revolves around this cliche of somebody getting too big for their britches and wanting to get out of the band i think it's one of the best rock and roll movies ever made and i'm a guy who will watch tommy like three times a week and Margaret, baby. Dude, the, bake, the, the baked beans baked and the beans long pillow. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I, I, it's nashy. Oh. <laughs> it made me a man. See, yeah. see now, if you were someone that's pre-show, you would have got that joke really good, that it's nashy, oh. You know, but, um... <laughs> and come to think about it, this is an all-Tennessee show, because that's where Suzanne's from, too. Just throwing it out there. But, um... I, know, I, lived, I lived in Memphis, and I lived in Knoxville. Yes. I spent 15 years in Tennessee. There you go. But now let Suzanne go next. Tell us about Sue. Oh, my God. It's funny mentioning the musician thing since I'm surrounded by musicians. And my husband was actually a touring musician for a while. And everything in the movie, you could, there are times I can see him cringe. <laughs> but this movie, there's a few things I'm going to say. This is one of the most quotable movies and people will catch it when you say something. You know, it's like, hello, uh, Cleveland. Hello, Cleveland. And my favorite is 11. I, I, I swear I will find ways to throw, well, it just needs to go to 11. Turn it up to 11. Sometimes I get weird looks. Most of the time I get somebody, like, hee-hawing and knee-slapping when I say that. But... There's just certain things in this movie. I'm just going to try to pinpoint a few little things that I find absolutely hysterical. When Nigel's going back doing the the wonderful 80s deep knee bends with the guitar and then falls on his back and has to <laughs> help getting himself up. And I was watching my husband play bass one night and oh. I could tell his knee locked when he was trying to pull one of those poses. I'm like, oh shit, here we go again, Nigel. And, I, but I, the thing is, you know, I mean, there's, I go see a lot of bands and I, I see, especially some of the older guys, they're, they're kind of struggling physically trying to do some of the stuff that they did when they were younger and they're no longer able, but that's okay. Nigel did it first. You're good. And the whole David and those drawings that Janine did said, we're going in a new direction with the bonds. <laughs> well, you're a cancer. And they're all just looking at this going, really? Oh, I wish I was a cancer. <laughs> <laughs> but this is just one of those movies that just, it, it. I watch it probably far more often than I should. I could pop this movie in anywhere. I can start reciting the movie from beginning to end without very much trouble. And my favorite review is like, Shark sandwich. <laughs> Shark sandwich. Just a two-word review. It just says. <laughs> that can't be real. You can't. <laughs> what is it saying? That was our accident. <laughs> I, I just, th this movie is just absolutely, it's going to sound goofy, but it's fucking charming. It just <laughs> is. And there's just, it's, it's just one of those movies that it's, I don't want to say classic, so I'm going to say timeless. It always has something relevant if you've ever been a fan of music. Not the shit that they call music now, but, you know, real bands, real instruments, real writers. I know I'm being kind of snobbish, but that's kind of how I feel. But, yeah, this movie is just timeless. Cool. Rick? I have built my life around Spinal Tap. <laughs> 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 I really have. Just like Suzanne was saying, I can pretty much quote this movie from beginning to end. You know, it's like, how much more black could it be? You know, it's like, it's not, you know, pastel black. <laughs> uh, just everything about it, the impact that it had. How about the level of just improv that's in this movie? You can tell that they're just going off and just keeping the film rolling and just seeing what's worth keeping. That really sets the stage for a lot of the shows that Eugene Levy and all these people come up later on, like you said, Christopher Guest kind of helming, you know, the, the, the lead and all that kind of stuff and creating that, that world. And we have this movie to thank for that. Cause that's really, 
in my opinion, where it started. Uh, I wore this movie out. I wore the soundtrack out. I've seen them live on the Breaks Like the Wind tour. <laughs> uh, I have a That's... Spinal Tap lunchbox. <laughs> Break Like the Wind's an underrated album, by yeah, the way. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, and an elephant never forgets, you know. <laughs> but yeah, uh, just the songs. I mean, I was I was in a band and we opened up a show back. We did a, a it's a one time gig and we opened the show with tonight I'm gonna rock you. And there's nothing like standing in front of a bunch of people you know and singing you're sweet but you're just four feet and you still got your baby teeth. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I just I love everything about this movie and i love all the stories from professional musicians that say you know that that really happened you know ozzy didn't think it was funny at all <laughs> you know <laughs> and you know i hear stories of uh the drummer for ronnie james dio he when the show started he was inside this pyramid the pyramid's supposed to raise open and reveal the drum kit well just like Derek in his pod it didn't open so he spent like 45 minutes of the whole gig playing inside this t this pyramid, <laughs> and nobody ever saw him. <laughs> so you just gotta love. Come on, man, Stonehenge. I mean, the the not only Stonehenge the song, but the whole setup of it, the the drawing on the napkin, putting inches instead of feet. You know, the the druids coming out dancing. The conversation afterwards, where Derek goes, well, maybe we should just move it. What do you mean? So they shan't trot upon it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the problem was. <laughs> oh, man. It's just so great. If I told him once, I told him a thousand times to put Spinal Tap first and then Puppet Show. <laughs> you know, when I was back in the early aughts, I used to play in an acoustic band. And when it came time to ask for tips, we would play Give Me Some Money. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It didn't work, but we did it. <laughs> Oh, I sing Big Bottom all the time and Sex Farm. Nice, nice. And it's just, you know, you gotta. <laughs> now, I always find myself humming Hellhole. Oh, yeah. You know where you're standing in a hellhole. Really <laughs> <laughs> at work. Oh, man. This whole, this, the, the whole mockumentary thing is such an interesting subgenre to me because what we talked about this briefly at the beginning, but this is not a Christopher Guest movie. This is a Rob right. Reiner flick, but this feels so much like the rest of Christopher Guest's mm -hmm. filmography that it's easy to forget that he didn't direct it. And it gets more obfuscated by the fact that Guest was in Reiner's arguably most popular movie, The Princess Bride. So there's some creative mm -hmm. synergy between the two, but hardly anybody thinks about what I think is the first mockumentary, and that's um, Real Life by Albert Brooks. Mm. Brooks's, oh, movie, wow. Brooks's movie does this great kind of flip around in the third act and it becomes more about the filmmaker than the family that's supposed to be the subject of the film and that's it's a great movie yeah. i'm going to go ahead and highly yeah. recommend that but you know guest may not have invented the mockumentary as some people believe but i do think that he right. perfected and established the genre as a capital t thing yeah without a doubt i mean we watch waiting for guffman a lot <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go home and bite my pillow. <laughs> oh. Yes, yeah, so many so many great bits in this movie. I mean, the, the, you've seen, we've seen you've seen highlights of them all, all over, you know, I, I love the 70s documentaries, stuff like that, you know, and it's well deserved, you know, in, in, in that cuz it's, it's there's very funny stuff that and stuff that's really funny. I think it's very organic. Um you, you, we got in credit scenes in these different films now, but they have through credit scenes, which I, I take it are outtakes in this movie. And one of the things that makes you laugh the hardest is some, some of the smallest things, like when, when David's talking about these these books on tape that he's getting in the mail, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I got this one from Doctor J. Yeah, and it's Julius. Erd. Oh, let's say they keep it going then with the thing. <laughs> It's so good. One of the seven things I find kind of funny is, you know, they have that those same two groupies, and the coal sword just travels from Jeez. band member to band member to band member. <laughs> and I didn't, the first probably five times I didn't realize it, and all of a sudden I was like, 
oh my god, that's funny as hell. It's such a fine line between clever and stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did you see Duke Fame's album cover? I mean, you know, he's like laying there, tied down, and they're like knocking all over him, and it's no worse than smell the glove. What's wrong? What's, what's wrong with being sexy? What's wrong with being sexy? Sexy. <laughs> yeah, Fran Drescher is still looking. She still looks great today, but yeah, seeing a young Fran Drescher, you know, pre pre what most know her is now is you know the whiny Fran Drescher nanny character. He it just it's uh. It's always nice to see that, and Patrick Mc- oh. McNee shows up in this movie for no reason. Yeah. Sir Dennis Eaton Hog. Tap <laughs> into America! So fucking random. Paul uh, Schaefer. Yeah. Artie Thufkin, Palmer Records. Artie Thufkin, Palmer Records. <laughs> Kick this ass. Kick this ass. <laughs> I fucked up. Yeah. I fucked up. The, 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 the point where we're... Um, where, where Nigel leaves and they they have to cope with some new shit. So Derek decides to go back into jazz fusion again, and they do it at the jazz show. Odyssey. Jazz Odyssey. <laughs> Own bass. Derek Smalls. He wrote he this. Wrote this. <laughs> he wrote this. <laughs> just throwing him out of the fucking bus. And they can't sit there in the audience with this, just giving them a thumbs down. <laughs> that's, one the, that's one of the things I love about this movie is rock and roll movies are hard. Because they get cloying so fast. But one of the things that makes Spinal Tap endearing is that it incorporates all of those great rock and roll tropes without really beating you over the head with them. Like, mm-hmm. for such a broad parody, Spinal Tap really shines when it is subtle. Like, fucking David St. Hubbard's awful girlfriend comes in and basically breaks up the band all of <laughs> Yoko Ono, and there's all that satanic panic heavy metal imagery from the 80s, that giant horned skull that dominates the live stage presentation, and like we talked about before, that, oh my god, that dopey, mystical overtone in Stonehenge is just fucking hilarious, but it's all so on the nose, and those are areas that are just ripe for comic abuse, but it's all handled in this deadpan way that makes it even funnier. No one knows who they were. Oh, oh, what they were what doing. They were doing. <laughs> the little cheering at Stonehenge. 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 <laughs> no, I would like to. Th- I would. I would like to think that they didn't see that, you know, until the scene happened. Because the, the 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 general gasps on their face, like they're waiting for something much larger than the small thing that comes down. It's like you're waiting. Like yeah, they seemed genuinely amused by what was going on until it happened and. The little people come out is fucking magical, you know. And when we saw them live, they had a FedEx guy come out with an envelope, and David St. Hubbins opened it up, and it was even smaller stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I will say, when the show opened, they started with Tonight I'm Gonna Rock You, and they came down from the ceiling, but like suspended. And David came down, he's, you know, their own wires, and he lands on the ground, walks up the mic, starts singing, and then Derek comes down, and his feet are like three inches from the floor. So he's just <laughs> swinging. And he's doing tiptoes to get some momentum so he can swing by the mic and sing backups. <laughs> so he'll be like, I'm going to rock it! I'm going to rock it! <laughs> he down halfway and it just locks up. And he's just stuck up there the whole time. And of course, they got a guy on the side of the stage that's working these levers. And of course, now just flipping him off and, you know, trying to get down. And it's great. <laughs> so this is a panel show. So let me ask who is your favorite member of Spinal Tap? There you go. I didn't understand anything. Anybody, I just heard blah, blah, blah. Right, blah, blah, blah. So blah, blah, blah. That's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Ricky, blah, blah, your favorite. No, tell us who Ricky, you know. I, I have to go with Derek for some reason. Uh, yes. I, I guess because he's kind of the silent character. But but at the same time, I mean, the whole, you know, aluminum foil situation, the preserved moose, the smoking the pipe, the, the, you know, the spandex with the... It's definitely not a cucumber at that point, but whatever he's got down his pants during Big Bottom, it's just hilarious. I mean, he, let's face it, he is modeled. He's got to be modeled after the bass player from Triumph. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Looks, yes. Just like <laughs> Looks just like Mike Levine. Looks just like him. And just his, his, he's trying to be the cool one in the band as far as, you know, just like, well, maybe we should just move it away so they shot trot upon it. He's trying to be the reasonable one in this real, real awkward rock and roll situation. And 
it's just that that personality thing because the other two act like you expect rock guys to act. He really does it. <laughs> so we're not doing Stonehenge? No, we're not fucking doing Stonehenge. <laughs> Brings up a very interesting question at this point. <laughs> See, I'm with Rick. I'm with Rick. I'm a Derek Smalls guy. I think Harry Shearer is just hilarious there, and he tries so hard to keep the peace between Tuffle and St. Yeah. Hubbins, right. but, he's, but he's still trying to keep his more artistic aspirations in play. I mean, he smokes that posh pipe. He's got that luxurious mustache that Triple H later had, and then he's got, he, he's got, he tries to introduce progressive jazz music into the band's repertoire, and that is never, never a good idea, because no. that's usually the death knell for a rock band. That's kind of like when a horror franchise decides the next chapter of the saga should take place in outer space. Right. But, I have to say, that scene where Nigel Tufnell does the solo and he plays the guitar with an actual violin, <laughs> that is one of the funniest rock and roll movie bits I've ever seen. It's so the fact that he stops and tunes the violin. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I think I'm missing on one of my favorite points when Nigel has left. And they're talking, well, we could do that. You know, we were doing a, a rock musical based on Jack the Ripper, you know, yeah. Saucy Jack. Saucy Jack. You're a naughty one. Saucy Jack. Saucy Jack. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like Nigel, and honestly, just a few little things. This he gets all deep. He's playing, you know, D minor, the status <laughs> of all chords, and it's called "Lick My Love Pump." Right. You know, I'm heavily influenced by Mozart and Bach. This is kind of a mock piece, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and. I, me, I also will obsess on some of the most ridiculous things. And the little bread, the way he's well, fold it like that. Well, it doesn't fold that way. <laughs> and then you got this. I mean, would you be holding this? And look, in here, who's in this one? Little guy in here. Who's in this one? No one. <laughs> <laughs> but I keep see me I'm a professional. I'm a professional just... I'll rise above. <laughs> Oh, sorry, go ahead. They definitely all got their parts, man. I mean, but again, Derek playing bass in that pod when it's closed up and the guy's banging <laughs> on it with a hammer, and he's just burning it up, man, playing this really cool bass solo in the middle of that song. You got to give him cred, man. Who's your favorite tap member, Gary? Oh, probably David, because he's just so, like, oblivious to, to everything. It, 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 it's, it's quite spectacular. Um. I, I love them all, but yeah, that's probably the one that I, I would choose out of all these people. And I, I think it's I think it's very important to say that um, these guys are legit musicians, and the music in the film has has transcended generations. Because you can go play rock band, I forget which one it is, and there's two tap songs on rock band. I think it's rock band three. I think it is. We've owned it, and I, I've I've played it poorly because I, I'm shit at that game, but um. <laughs> T Tonight I'm in a Rocky with for sure is on Rock Band, <laughs> so pe people, you know, younger people are playing these songs, probably not knowing what the fuck they are, but you, you know what? It, it, they're hitting it, and I'm glad it's out there. Let's put it that way. Uh, Ying was searching for his Yang. <laughs> <laughs> the goddamn the, the drummer thing. I brought this up where when, when I sort of announced Ricky was going to be on this review. I was like, yeah, it, 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 he'll make it if he if he he if he, he survives his last gig. Well, the gag in this film is that every every Spinal Tap drummer has had a horrible accident. So, you know, gardening accident. You can't, uh, you can't really dust for vomit. You know? <laughs> Sp spontaneous combustion leaves a. a what does he like say? Just a flash of green light. Just a, a glob a globule well, on the a stage. <laughs> it's more like a stain, really. You know. This is the time to say that the guy who plays Spinal Tap's final drummer, Joe Mama Besser, Joe uh, Mama is, Besser. is a guy named Fred Asparagus, and he's the same guy who played the bartender in Three Amigos. Yeah. Nice. And he was also yeah. in uh, uh, Terror in the Owls. He's the guy sitting there in the, in, the, in the theater, and he goes, hey, how'd they do that? Exactly. That's the guy. Yeah, and that's something probably no one cares about but me. So okay. No, I care about that greatly because you know why? Dear dear the buttercup. That's why I care about that. You know. <laughs> it's like beer. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was watching the credits because you got to watch the credits, and I noticed that that Joyce Heiser, who you may not know her name, but it's the first fair tits I've ever seen in a film. Uh, thank you, just one of the guys. It shows up in this movie as one of the groupies, and that's something for for me to to, to, to ponder on and to look for, you know. Um, but, but, She's so, barely recognizable, though. I, I don't look like the same girl. Again, it's the same first pair of tits I've ever seen. So I got to look for it now. It's, it's very important stuff as a young man. Yeah, you know. I mean, <laughs> you, you never forget your first nipples. <laughs> you could barely see them nipples. Yeah, that's the truth. And these guys are really looking too. Come on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Hey, have you guys seen the the uh, lost footage? I guess that they put back in for some of the DVDs and stuff. Where when Nigel leaves, they then she, you know, uh, David's girlfriend brings in an ex boyfriend to be the next guitar player and a singer, and it's Paul Sortino, who's really a really good singer. Have you uh, seen any of that stuff? No. Oh, I've got the criteria, isn't it? It's on the Studio Canal version that I've got. Oh, shit. Okay. It's got, it's got quite a bit of uh, extra stuff that was cut out. Was, but they bring this other guy in, and he's a hot shot, and he kind of starts stealing the show. And the crowd loves him, and they end up firing him because he's too good, you know? <laughs> well, that's what all good bands do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's really hard to review comedy like this, but, you know, there, there's so many bits that I, I've seen – you know, me and Suzanne frequent conventions quite a bit, and there's that, that, that table that nobody's at. And when they have their record store appearance and they, they have that look of boredom on their face and disappointment, I, I've seen that many, many times, and I've gone to that table before just just to talk to this person. And, you know. Yeah, but even sometimes when you go up and talk to them and you're genuinely, D.B. Sweeney, I'm talking to you, ah. really, really excited to meet them, and they still have this uh, bored demeanor of, like, Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Damn. She she had this experience with David Naughton too. I didn't have that experience <laughs> with David Naughton. No, he once again there was no line, no wait, nobody, and he barely would speak three words to me. Hmm. Hmm. Bob, sorry. Yeah, you know, you you get that size, and and of course, you, you know, they should be the same, Body. but. Come on, man. At a lot of these conventions, you get some wackos that come up and drive them insane. It's kind of like Savini. Savini, you hear horror stories of, well, you don't know who you're going to get. I've been around him when he was super nice. I've been around him when he was anything but nice. And But at the same time, you got all these, you know, lunatics that are super fans like my buddy David, and they will absolutely drive you up a wall. So, <laughs> you know, I can get it, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, but I've, I've, I've only had a couple of those. In most of the experiences I've had, everybody is really, really, you know, nice, happy to talk about movies. We'll right. share a couple of stories with you. Right. And, you know, I got I super lucked out. One of my childhood posters on my wall, <laughs> Dirk Benedict, was an absolute fucking doll. <laughs> John Cusack. <clears throat> no. <laughs> Uh, we don't talk Roddy, about Cusack. I believe that alone, yeah. <laughs> Roddy Piper was the, ni the nicest we met. He you can be civil to the people spending that kind of money. Yeah. You need to take your bitch home. Hey, we don't talk about Cusack. <laughs> believe it alone. <laughs> yeah, we should leave that one alone. <laughs> Speaking of which, Danny and I just went to the, the horror e event that they had there in Nashville, and Billy Zane was there, and he was charging like 80 bucks <laughs> for an autograph. Like, wow, well, he was... Know, Forty bucks here. I know, and I was like, you know, we love you, we love you, Billy, but not that much. <laughs> you, you, better be, you better be judging a dance off for eighty bucks. <laughs> he, he is a charismatic motherfucker, though, so I give him that. He now. is, man. I mean, he's he's cool as crap. Said standing over there, man, and you know, you can get drawn in, but eighty bucks, man, that's that's hard to part with. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, it is. And I think I told Gary, two feet away from John Hughes, I'm like, wow. I could have set 80 bucks on fire and had more fun with it. That's right. Now, Danny got to meet, uh, oh, man, was her name? Diane from from uh, from Better Off Dead. Diane Franklin, yes. Franklin. I've never seen Danny get starstruck before. She's a lovely woman. Very he lovely. She starstruck. Our... She even let him wear the jacket she wore in Better Off Dead. Mm -hmm. and put it on, had a picture yeah, she brings it with her. So, yeah. Oh, so, my gosh. Yeah, you mentioned, um, you know, releases... You mentioned that, 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 um, what do you call it? There we go. Studio Canal release. Mm -hmm. Uh, apparently they got fucked out of money on that deal and 
Yeah. They got $179 in sales for merchandising music over the prior three decades. And um, <laughs> Harry Shearer sued for $125 million because, you know, much like this and much like uh, A Mighty Wind, you know, words of music by, by these guys. And they deserve better than that, you know? <laughs> Wow. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know a whole lot more we, we could say about this one without giving away the whole goddamn thing if you haven't seen it before. Yeah. But if you haven't seen Spinal Tap, for fuck's sake, come on. Yeah, if yeah. you haven't seen this in Spinal Tap, it's made a lot of lists, it's made a lot of documentaries, and it's all fucking well deserved in so many ways. Because every time I watch it, like I, I watched this and I watched Best in Show today for for a review uh, upcoming in the week. And I said, do I need to watch it again? No, but I'll watch them again for the 25th <laughs> fucking time because I want to, you know. For... Have you guys seen Heavy Metal Memories, the, the, the greatest hits Spinal Tap album commercial? No. Oh. Blackie Lawless is in it. <laughs> what? Back when he was Back when he was nobody because it was made back when they made the movie. And they, it's like a greatest hits album. It's called Heavy Metal Memories, and it's got pretty much every song from the soundtrack on there. But they're they make it look like one of those K-Tail commercials where people are walking in the sand and the beach, but they're you know, but he's, they're playing playing Sex Farm. <laughs> Listen, yeah. what the flower, what the flower people, people say. People say, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I need a dick. That's probably on YouTube. You can find that. Fucking sitar solo in that that freaking song, just <laughs> tripping out, the, the screen spinning. I can't, I can't stand. There's so many things. That's yeah. Vision. Yes. What about what about uh, Derek Smalls going? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Best part of the whole thing. Yes. <laughs> Here's the thing. You can tell the Spinal Tap is a classic by the way that it got incorporated into other pieces of entertainment like SNL skits, commercials, right. just little bits here and there. But I have to say that my favorite Spinal Tap thing is based on a, a, a relatively short bit in the movie where Spinal Tap is playing Cleveland and they get lost uh, in the hall and they can't find their way to the stage. And they keep running into the same guy who's like working on, I don't know, pipes or something back there, but they can't find their way to the actual stage. 1998. The WCW Fall Brawl. Chris Jericho did a spot where he got lost on the way to the ring before a match with Bill Goldberg. And he's walking around backstage yelling, rock and roll, and hello, Winston Salem. And at one point, he opens a set of crash doors that leads outside, and he knows he's just fucked everything up. And it's just, it is hilarious. It's one of the most clever pieces of business I've seen in a, in a wrestling show. Probably one of the funniest things Jericho ever did, and he's an entertaining guy to begin with but that's how you know that your movie has made it when other people will take it and incorporate it into their own their own spots how how about metallica doing the black album i mean come on precisely they literally precisely. just did spinal tap and they just made the album a black cover there's like a tiny little snake in the corner yeah. of it and that was it but i mean they even said yeah it's you know spinal tap <laughs> i mean and with a, the white album not a goddamn thing on it. <laughs> Without Spinal Tap, there will be no Death Clock, and I think it'd be a lesser world for it, you know. And if you know Death well, Clock is, they they're the subject of, huh? Meet up at the Electric Banana Club. Yes. It may not be there, but I'm sure we'll find it. If you don't know who Death Clock is, they are the subject of of a cartoon show called Metalocalypse, which is basically the death metal version of Spinal Tap. Uh, release the kitties, man. It's so, so there's good. Also, there, there's also a music video for Hell Hole. I don't know if y'all have seen that or not either. So. Oh, yeah. So they're in the swimming pool. <laughs> no, I actually um, requested it so much. Hell Hole is on the uh, touch tunes at work. <laughs> I usually go for Christmas with the devil. I use that, you know, after Thanksgiving. With the oh, yeah. devil. <laughs> How many times have you heard Pat play Christmas with the devil, Gary? Zero. <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. You've been around our house around Christmas time. Right. No, the second day after Thanksgiving, I pull out Christmas and Hollis. He pulls out Christmas with the devil. Okay. Yeah. Two awesome ones. It's on our holiday playlist for sure. Man, oh man, we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna hit hit the, the the wrap up button here. I'm gonna kick it back to Ricky again. Can I and say one more thing? You could. I will get. I will. I, I, no, I did. I did. 
Goomba. Okay, X first then, because he's fucking being fucking demanding a little ass right now. Come on, go for it, yeah. I'm, I'm a shit fuck. And just one more thing real quick. Spinal Tap, in the very beginning of the movie, is described as one of England's loudest bands. But at that time, the actual loudest band in the world was The Who that cranked mm-hmm. out 126 decibels at a 1976 show in London, which is stupid loud, and no wonder Pete Sound is deaf. So go mm-hmm. ahead and do your thing now. I'll be quiet. <laughs> such, he's such a bitch. Listen to him, man. You know that was great. Now, now Ricky, it's your turn. Anything else to say about the film? And what do you give it? One, two, eleven. <laughs> well, first of all, to 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 go with what X just said, they were actually handing out little packets of earplugs at the concert that said "Spinal Tap World's Loudest Band." <laughs> Wear for your own protection. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, again, I've already said it. I, my life is built around Spinal Tap. I have many great friends that are great friends because we love Spinal Tap so much, and that's all you got to do to be a friend of mine. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much it. So uh, there's there's not enough things I can say about it. I just absolutely love it. And, of course, it, it's going to 11, and you can't play because if your wife or whatever, whatever the fuck she is. Suzanne. I keep trying to think of more to say, and there's plenty. But yeah, this is this film is pretty much perfection. The just the banter, the interactions, everything that Reiner did. Like I said, we'll all meet up at the Electric Banana one day. <laughs> I love this movie. It is straight up. It's one better. It's an eleven. Cool, Jeffrey X. Barton. It's a bit too much fucking perspective there, Suzanne. Um, <laughs> I think within the context of this series of shows, this is Spinal Tap is interesting because this is where you kind of see the genesis of Christopher Guest's directorial career. The style of the mockumentaries that he would make later are really influenced by Reiner's style, if not a full-fledged aping of it. And this is where Guest put together his core performers. Michael McKean's here. Fred Willard shows up. Uh, Harry Shearer is here, and he's in A Mighty Wind. So it's not technically a Christopher Guest movie, but it might be the most important movie in his entire career. And with that, I will agree with everyone else and say that Spinal Tap is an 11 out of 10. I'm not proud of that. I'm not proud that I'm saying that, but it's definitely an 11. <laughs> one better. Yes, one more, isn't it? Yes. Ah. This is so nice. Yeah. <laughs> By turn out a gloat. You think you'd like to work a job like that? I don't know. What are the hours? <laughs> <laughs> no, sir, we don't have that. Do you like black? You know, I think I could do that. <laughs> uh, I also would like to work at a haberdasher as well. But um, that, that's a... Uh... I'd probably work with children. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what can I say? The music is, is amazing. The, the, like X said, you know, without this is Spinal Tap, I don't think Christopher Guest's work would be as, as prolific as it is as, as a director. Um, this is some deep roots here, and it's very important. If you've seen the other ones you haven't seen this, you, you need to rectify that in a major fucking way. Um, multiple editions to buy, digitally and physically. Um, go get both, man. Yeah, I, I recommend it, you know. That's what I love about my digital collection. If I'm on the road and I'm going to watch Big Trouble in Little China, I, I can click a button and say I can watch it right now. You know? Same thing with Spinal Tap. Um, funny as hell. You know? Hurtful as hell to certain people I know that are musicians. And it's just, it's 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 wonderful. And um, it, 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 it gets the 11 every time. So we're not biased at all, people. We just love it that much. And it, it deserves your love, too. Man, oh man. But that is it for this one, and uh, we'll come back with something else. From 1965 to 1983, rock and roll has been here to stay, and no one has done more staying than international recording stars Spinal Tap. Now, for the first time, Metal House presents this special TV collection, Heavy Metal Memories, a treasury of 18 years of nerve-damaging music by one of England's loudest bands. You'll hear timeless Spinal Tap favorites like... Stonehenge, 
This amazing record package is not sold in any store or through this special TV offer. And what Spinal Tap collection would be complete without their unforgettable international number one hit? Listen to the Flower People. Listen to what the Flower People say. Heavy metal memories will last forever. But at this special price, they can't last long. So act now. Heavy metal memories will make your brain explode and your ears cry for mercy. And it makes a swell gift, too, don't it? Now here's something we hope you'll really like. He comes from beyond time from beyond the outer limits of your imagination. He's the master of the flying guillotine. And he's ready to blow your mind. With more nerve-shattering special effects than you have ever seen before. It's a trip into a world where warriors from the ends of the universe meet in combat that knows no boundaries. A world where silent soldiers of death try everything in their power to conquer the most gruesome weapon ever conceived. See special visual effects filmed entirely in Super Cinevision as the master of the flying guillotine encounters the most amazing creatures in this or any world. As he experiences the most spectacular adventures the mind can imagine. The master of the flying guillotine. Yes, uh, for the beef anniversary. And who knows, we might do more of these. Um, this is the first edition of the Cripple Theater. Uh, I am Gary, and I'm here with Ricky Morgan. How you doing, sir? What's up? What's up, man? Uh, what a great movie to cover, man. This is going to be a blast to talk about uh, because there's so many elements in this that is so wrong, but it's so awesome. Yeah, the reason uh, we're doing Cripple Theater is because I always thought it was fascinating when when somebody does extraordinary things that, that have an ailment. It's not like being and if, if you're really woke out there you're offended by the term crippled theater right but i'm not sorry okay it's just, it's, <laughs> it is what it is you know uh, but the first film we're doing in this this series of reviews is master of the flying guillotine from 1976 yeah um this is written directed and starring uh the late jimmy wang Yu, who um this is actually a sequel i mean a sequel to a film called called the one-armed boxer and um, yeah. I, I I didn't realize that right away because I, I haven't seen it because this this is a film that, you know, if you're a kung fu enthusiast and you're a budding kung fu enthusiast, you, you could be p people. This is what people talk about that you should see. Yeah. No this. doubt, man. This it's it's everything that a exploitation B movie martial arts film wants to be. This movie's got it all in it, man. <laughs> Yeah, this and stuff like Five Deadly Venoms and oh, yeah. you know, there's there's so many, but yeah, you know, this this is a top of their list that that you know not novice martial arts fans should watch, and for good reason too, because it's you know amongst the, the silliness, it, which if he did, did the plot of this movie is there's a an old man who, who <laughs> had students or, or lieutenants that were killed by the one armed boxer in the very first movie. Um, because they were evil opium dealers, I think it was, or something. That he, yeah, he, he he lost yeah. his arm and he had to get revenge in his first movie, which I have to watch now because um, I, I have never seen it before. So oh, it'd be nice really? to watch the first yeah. part to this movie. Um, so he's pondering, thinking uh, about the one-armed boxer and what he can do to, to go find him. And there's a tournament going on. So he's going to go to the tournament and kill any one-armed boxer that he sees. <laughs> That's the beauty of this. Uh, in the nutshell, right, when this comes down to it, you've got a blind 
guy that's hiding out in the middle of nowhere, getting messaged by carrier pigeons that his other people have died. If you're getting this message from this pigeon, somehow we released this pigeon before we died. But this just that means we died. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure that part out. But uh, I'm sending you a pigeon because we've already died. How that happens, who knows? But yeah, dude just uh, decides that a blind dude with a flying guillotine is going to go around and try to kill every one-armed person in China, I guess, because that way he makes sure he gets the right one. It's kind of like the Hanson brothers in uh, Slapshot. And when he gets hit in the head with the keys, <laughs> is this the guy? Yeah, and he punches him. No, that's not him. It's the other guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you got a blind dude running around cutting heads off of one-armed people. I mean, that's <laughs> that's this movie. <laughs> it, it was insane about it is you know the carry pigeon thing. First of all, is is, is got to be like the most indirect dear John letter ever. By the way, <laughs> this is from your your, your Lennon's, uh we're, we're dead if you read this, right. you know, and th- this guy did it. Okay, let me go find him. And the cool thing, uh, why, why it's called Master of the Flying Guillotine, is that his weapon is like this basket thing on a chain yeah. with retractable blades all around it to where when it lands on somebody's head perfectly, he can yank said chain and pull the guy's head clean off. Not to mention, this is a blind guy doing it. The blind so, guy doing it, yes. I don't I don't think a guy that could see could do this, but anyways, maybe that's the point. So he, he's doing it all by his, his 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 other senses, and it has to be. It, it looks very light, first of all, for for whatever it is, but also very bloodless. So in I, this I, thing, you know, with his dandelion fly, <laughs> flying guillotine machine, he could cauterize wounds apparently. And, and even yeah, even if. Uh, even if it's not the best of throws, it's got a net that drops down to completely cover your head and finish the job. So, <laughs> you know, they thought in a a a uh, uh, mistake proof <laughs> function of the guillotine. <laughs> Only thing that make it better would drop bees like Nicolas Cage in The Wicker Man. Right. <laughs> Confused I just by the love, bees. Comes I love the opening of the movie because you've got the old blind dude out here. He's He's got a full head of hair. I mean, it's it's a big, massive wig he's wearing and eyebrows that are just unmatched. There's nobody that has eyebrows like this guy. And he's just out punching the air, you know, like you do when you're some kind of martial arts master. He gets the message, and then dude just goes eight bat shit crazy and sets his house on fire and goes on a vendetta. We have to mention the the wooden dummies that he has for the, just yeah. such occasion of revenge. <laughs> yeah, because he has to practice his craft of this flying uh, sure. chained weapon. So he, he has wooden dummies built in his backyard to to <laughs> aim and shoot. Now this is a problem for later on in the movie where our one on boxers try to outsmart the, the the blind man. And yeah. but these things aren't moving, but maybe in the wind a little bit. Who, Knows, but he's chucking this thing, and he's pulling these heads off these wooden dummies. Like, yep, I I knew this day would come, so I had this carved out of the cheapest wood possible. You know. <laughs> but yeah, man, when he gets ready to go, he just jumps up through his house, busts through the roof, sets the house on fire, and then this. Let, let's talk about this theme song, man. The, the main theme of this movie is like a punk band, and it's killer. <laughs> Uh, all the music in this film is unauthorized, by the way, to use, and I think that's why it didn't have like a major release for a long time. Yeah, I mean it's it's definitely some sort of punk band, you know, because you're talking mid to you know going into the late '70s, so that that was the movement. You got that music going on, and the theme that every time that the 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 blind master of the guillotine's walking around, it sounds like music that Rob Zombie would use in one of his movies. So it's like, mm-hmm. wow, this is kind of ahead of its time. Yeah, it's wild, man. You know? Yeah. Well, our one boxer has a school, and he's he- he's hesitant to 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 go to the tournament. They they make a big deal like this tournament's happening. Blah 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 blah. And he he's like, oh, he mentions something about not wanting to be exposed by the government, so he might be like in some kind of protection program or something. <laughs> I, I don't know how Chinese uh, schools work. I don't know. That's You're right. <laughs> it's it's weird, but but they do they do go and to to. Have his students, you know, learn how to breathe and how to walk on air, apparently, because, you know, the, wow. the, the, art, the art of jumping is very hard to them. And he just compliments everything. He's like, wow, that guy jumps very well. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, yeah. learn something yeah, by of students. Not, 
their idea of jumping is totally different than ours because we're thinking, hey, I can I can clear these 15 blocks. No, he's like, no, take that wicker basket and you know set it up right and walk around the edge of it with nothing in it. <laughs> and then fun. he pulls a line of Richie on him and starts walking on the ceiling. Yep. And then he just climbs down and goes, that's all I'm teaching you for today. It's like, you didn't teach us anything. You were just showing out. <laughs> Looking like Turbo and Breaking 2, just, you know. Right, exactly. But, yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was so funny because he acts like he's teaching them this lesson, but he doesn't teach them. It's kind of like at work when they say, this has to be done, but they're not going to teach you how to do it. you got to figure it out on your own. So, yeah, he uh, he walks on the ceiling, does a little, you know, little shim-sham there, and and, uh, and just, that's it. He's done. Class dismissed. <laughs> He went to the Terry Silver School of Karate. You know, he he he, he shows them, hey, look what I can do. I'm not going to tell you how I did it, though. Right. But, uh, yeah, it's nuts. It did. <laughs> well, they get to the tournament, and I like this, that there's really no rules of this tournament. They, they You could have a weapon. You, you you don't have to have a weapon. Your hands could be your weapon. It's... One, one of the oh, – I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's that. I'm just agreeing with you. It's, it's the craziest setup for an, for an event. It's basically – well, let's face it. You know, everybody's riding the wave of Enter the Dragon at this point, right? So you had to throw this tournament in there because that's the hot topic of the time because you just had an iconic movie that <laughs> that's what the whole thing was about. So you kind of have to say when you look at this, it's a milder case of it, but this is Mortal Kombat, man. I mean, you got guys with big stretchy arms. You got – Oh, the Indian fighters. Oh, he got, comes out of nowhere doing some doll seam shit, you know. People, people with hidden blades and and monkey fighters, and I mean, you got it all right here. And and like you said, after that first fight, and you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> did nobody say there's any rules to this thing? Because it, it's like, no, we're just fighting to the death. I mean, from the get go. So wow. <laughs> and you get it all. You you like you know staff fighting. You you get eagle claw versus versus monkey. Monkey, monkey, monkey paw. You get all that right. stuff, and you get straight up. Um, again, the, the there's an Indian fighter in this film who, who's probably Asian as hell, or oh, yeah. whatever. But um, he could stretch his arms like Del yeah. Seam and Street exactly. Fighter, and nobody explains what this is. There's probably some kind of mystical stuff that I'm missing here, but it's unexplained why this man could can stretch his arms and you know cue hard punches and shit like that, and but. We're talking Freddy, back Freddy Cougar level arms too, man. Yeah, I mean, those man. things go out a mile. <laughs> Fucking people up with those arms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got the, the 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 tournament director's daughter, uh, Wu Xiaote, who's a American name. Apparently, is Doris Lung. She has other names that that are they're listed on IMDb. She's been in a whole bunch of stuff. A couple of these guys have been in a whole bunch of stuff, and yeah. um, she 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 wants to be in the tournament. She 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 wants to. You know, do her thing and prove herself with her eagle claw, and she she does, and she becomes the love interest of of, of um of our lead, the um yeah the damn the damn one armed boxer who's who's pretty cocky through all this. So I, I love his I love his style. I was saying, yes, I, I'll go to your tournament where I could possibly be fucking murdered by somebody because <laughs> he knew there was consequences to his killing those two lieutenants, and right he has to be totally under 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 fire for possibly at any time and it's like yes i will expose myself as this one-armed person and <laughs> yeah just waiting I mean, even when we get to the tournament is is over because you know people freaking die and um because um our our, our master of the flying guillotine shows up with his Razor basket taking people's heads off and stuff, and it's like, well, I guess tournament's <laughs> over. This guy's gonna kill anybody with a, with one arm, and like, yeah, that's a good way to, to, to stop it and ruin everything. But I, I love the uh, I love I'm the sorry. fight where the two guys are fighting and they both die, and so the the the, the guy just says they both win. <laughs> yeah, how did that work? Yeah, I love the fact of you know you're out there you're fighting to the death and they point out the loser and they say remove the loser of the match. <laughs> These people just come out and just drag them off. And then you got somebody out there sweeping the footprints. And this is a dirt you know stadium. It's a dirt floor. I'm like, what good does that do? I mean, <laughs> why are we dusting the the dirt? <laughs> it's like they're they're fixing the infield like at the baseball games. Right. Yeah. They take it that prof professional, you know. 
Uh, the tournament is just great. It's great. Yeah, it's wild. It's about, it's about half of the, it's about about a quarter of the movie, I'd say. Is, yeah, is yeah you, you totally forget about the, the the guillotine guy because he's not even in it for a long time. This tournament goes on for quite a bit, which is totally entertaining. Well, he's got to travel. He takes a long time to travel, and you know. <laughs> The, the, I'd love to see those bushy eyebrows get in the way, which they they are they are freaking insane. Man. There's there's another guy in the movie that has a mustache that looks like <laughs> the eyebrows. Yeah, he does. <laughs> it's like it's always like he got the mustache of you know the old weightlifters back you know the the bodybuilder guys they would have on the side shows at carnivals and stuff. Yep. It's that kind of mustache. It's big and bushy and stands way up. It's like, come on, man, <laughs> who made this decision? <laughs> It's wild, man. But then you get to, to, to the second half of this movie, which I think is just as exciting as the first half of this movie, because yeah, he, he go, um, our, our man, uh, Yu Tian Lung, the, the um, one on boxer, he goes back to his village, basically to to wait for the fucker to come get him. Yeah. So so in in this time, all these fighters come come to to go try to take him out or to or give him a warning, including our. our 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 stretchy armed Indian gentleman, yeah. Uh, which that's an awesome fight, and it's a great fight. Yeah. His, his his um, I guess like his first lieutenant, our our, our blind man, um, because he comes. Yeah, to I was going to say we forgot we forgot dancing dude. Yeah, dancing dude, dude in man. The he has to dance before he fights. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it's not like a they quick little jig. I mean, this dude breaks it down for 45, 50 seconds. You know, just just a full on dance. It's just weird. <laughs> I mean, our one on Boxer again, ballsy as fuck in this movie because he he set he sets the house on fire. They have a, they have a whole three amigos moment in this movie yeah. where he gets all the villagers to be on his side, yeah. you know, spears and all, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, instead of dressing up and faking them out, y'all just stand yeah. outside the windows with these po with these, these spears and keep him from jumping out. <laughs> so little old than one, so little old than one, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what an idea, though, setting, you know, putting putting the fire under the house and having a metal floor, I guess because he knew dude would be barefooted. Yeah, and, but, but this this is bad for you, too, though, because your feet are going to get burnt yeah, up, too, and yeah. you could possibly get burnt up inside your own house. This, right. but he, it's my favorite thing about this movie. He doesn't give a shit. No, He's he like, really yep, don't. I'm, I'm that bold. You know, come on. Yeah, but yeah, that's, that's a cool fight, man. We're not cool. That's a hot fight. <laughs> that's a hot fight, man. Yeah, and, then he, and as soon as it's over, he runs outside and dumps his feet into the water. You know, the 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 one arm boxman boxer sticks his feet in the water and he's like, "Ooh, <laughs> Ooh that feels good, man." Master, you did get you get the final? Here? Nope, just hot. <laughs> <laughs> you get to the final fight. He has like a whole like predator mode set up for him when oh. he comes. He he puts all this bamboo in the ground. Just to say, okay, I'm gonna stand in the bamboo. So when he throws his basket, he's gonna be picking apart the bamboo and not my face, you know, yeah. not 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 thinking that there's big gaps in this bamboo and you know eventually it's gonna get chopped down and I better watch my head. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and that doesn't work out as well for him as he thought because it does kind of nick him there a little bit. But he's got like three or four stages. It's almost like Game of Death where you go into these different levels because he just leads the blind man to other areas making it more difficult for him to be able to pick him out. And uh, I tell you what, this goes on for, what, 20 minutes of the movie? <laughs> them, them two facing off? It does. It's a, it's, it's a long it's, time. It's it's well thought out, though. It's very well thought yeah. out. You know, how, how would you fool a blind man that could that could use his other senses like crazy? Yeah. How would you impair that? You, you put, you know, you make random boxes of, of, of birds, and you open them up to yeah. confuse him. And yeah. Just just killing those poor birds, but whatever. No, no birds were harmed in the making of this film. At least I think so. I, I don't know, but um, <laughs> he goes in there and buys that coffin shop, you know. And you're like, why is he buying this place or wanting to use it, you know? So of course you get to see it later on. But the the fact of the big slats of wood that he could, you know, throw sound and make him react to him and and not know where he is, and also. The tricks of the the wood falling and it launching hatchets <laughs> at the blind guy in the yeah. process is pretty cool. Don't know how he did it, but pretty cool. It's all it's all crazy set up, and you know it could have went totally wrong for him, and it and it should have. But um, yeah. 
the fact that he set this this series of traps for him, and I think it's a it's a pretty cool twenty p twenty two minutes twenty minutes of cinema along to go along with the rest of this movie, and just just watching him fight. I know Jimmy Wang you wasn't a real one arm man, but watching what he can do, you know, with just that one arm was, was yeah. is pretty impressive, and just. The, the cockiness of the character, which is, by my think is the oh, MVP yeah. of this movie. Absolutely, you, you you believe it like the whole time, because he's not he's he's a good man, but he's 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 a very violent man because he has to be, and it's more like one of those Godfather moments. Like, yeah, I've, I've come come to this village and started this school, but I did yeah. just murder these two people that are pretty important to this guy. So you know, just when I'm out of violence, they 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 suck me back in. Suck you right <laughs> yeah. back in, right? Yeah, I and mean, that's that's kind of the beauty of this too, because you're rooting for a guy that's really kind of a bad guy, you know. So, yeah, that that's you know, it's weird how it, it turns and you're against, you know, Mr. Guillotine, and but really, I mean, <laughs> they're both not better than each other. So, you just he's you know the one armed boxer's got more relationships with other people there, and he's got a school and all that stuff. So you kind of feel drawn to be on his side. But come on, they're both bad dudes. Yep. Yeah, there's other fights we didn't mention in the movie. Like in the tournament, there's a, a pretty neat one where they're they have to balance themselves on top of, oh, them, yeah. on top of sticks with with, yeah. with swords on the bottom. So literally, fight you could fall to your death on top of these swords. But you got a dude that's fighting in there that can stand on the tips of swords. So yeah, barefooted. It's crazy. It's crazy, <laughs> man. It's unbelievable, but it's crazy. Um, <laughs> this film was a classic for so many reasons, and yeah. I'm not even sure if Blu-ray exists in this movie because of the music rights. Wow. I, I know One Armed Boxer um, has an Arrow Blu-ray that you can buy. Mm. Probably a special edition, knowing those guys. But I'm going to look this up real fast. Uh, do some more talking, Ricky, if you can think of some more stuff to talk about, sir. Well, I, I actually watched this on Tubi, and the copy they had on there was pretty dang decent. Um, so I don't know if there is an existing one out there. There's probably, there's probably one overseas or something you might could get a hold of, but... I don't know. That transfer they had on there was pretty good, and uh, you just kind of get thrown, like you said, by the title of the movie, and you start off with with this guy and his vendetta, and then you get you get to the tournament, and it just kind of uh, overshadows everything else going on. But it doesn't disappoint. I mean, there's so much, and I'm sure we're leaving out a lot of stuff, Gary. But oh yeah, there's a ton of fights in this. My only real complaint, and this is just the times. But there's really only about, I'm going to say seven, and that's probably a high number. There's only about seven sound effects in this whole movie. It doesn't matter if you're a you know, blind man on a hillside and you're punching the air, or if you're kicking somebody in the face, or if you're punching them in the face, or punching them in the ribs. It's all the same sound. It never changes. <laughs> so that's one thing I did notice. And there's there's a sound of things dropping to the ground and sound of some metal clanging. But other than that, the sound effects in this movie, that's pretty much it it's one punch sound that they use for everything <laughs> that's yeah, kind of fun i'm seeing a dvd copy of it on amazon for for 1432 mm. not like a dragon dynasty doesn't like that but it, it, it called the ultimate edition so you, huh. you can get it on there but it, it doesn't really have um like a super special edition available you know like, well, it, like it deserves to but like i think i think it might be the soundtrack issue because they basically he used all the music of this film from other films, mm. and yeah, they, they they stole it basically. So that they they can't. There's a lot of rights issues there, I'm sure, in the way of them putting out a really nice clean edition of this. Yeah, yeah, it's that's a shame that all those things get held up like that. But hey, it's a price you pay. But yeah. at least you can still see it. Yep, and I did watch it on Tubi as well. Uh, only real fault of the the print on there, and I'm not even sure how the other prints look either, is that it fades. In and out a little bit, you know, like from from light to dark a little bit, and yep. there's parts of it that, that are in Chinese. With, yeah, with, with I noticed that too. It's like, yeah, it's it's it, they're pulled a uh, an Argento on us, you know, like the deep red when they go back and put the footage back in that's in the original language, and yeah, you're trucking along, you're listening to the story, and he says, "Let me tell you about this guy." Then it's like, okay, I can't understand anything they're saying now. And then it goes back to, well, hey, Fred, how do you know that's true? I mean, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. So yeah, but, somebody but, but, found the original full in in you know uh, the full movie and, and released it with the extra scenes back in in the original language. 
they do give you more than enough for you to follow the story, though. So you're you're you're, yeah. you're fine on that end. So if yeah. you're you're bashful about Tubi, like I, oh, they have you know different languages in there. You could follow the film just fine. By you know that, get the way it is. That may make this qualify as that DVD you said, maybe the ultimate edition or whatever you called it, because that's usually when they go back and throw everything they can find back into it. So yeah, it could be the same edition on that DVD then. I, I got hope for Arrow though, because they, they 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 did put verses on Blu-ray, so it did, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, and oh boy, <laughs> versus is a movie you should watch, people. Fantastic. Um, but yeah, um, that's a Danny Danny Bennett favorite. Oh yeah, I, I, that's, yeah, that's, that's, I, I fell in love with it real fast, man. Yeah, that's a great um, one. Great movie. It's a cl- it's a classic for a reason. You know, yep. if, you, if you haven't watched it, seek it out. Uh, like I said, first 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 movie in the series, one on Boxer, is definitely on Arrow Blu-ray. You can buy that for, from them. I think they have a sale going out right now, and everything as we're recording this. Um, but yeah, go 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 check out uh go check this movie out yeah. and the other works of Jimmy Wang Yu because he's no longer with us. Uh, he's he's not coming to breakfast as they as they say. Um, <laughs> but good times, man. And um, oh yeah, yeah. This movie that like I said, it does not disappoint. You're you're not gonna be bored for one minute in this thing. It it just hits and keeps hitting. So uh like I said, it's if you're a martial arts fan it, on any level, this has gotta be a staple in your diet. Yeah, for sure. It was it was it was an introduction for me. And I watched very, very few of these um overseas martial arts films. I mean, Ricky, there's there's a small age gap between us, but it is an age gap nonetheless to sure. where you had access to like Kung Fu theater on Saturday. Yes, sir, man. That's, that's where it started with me. I mean, of course I grew up with the, the, you know, the Bruce Lee stuff and all that, but yeah. Uh, Kung Fu theater, man, that, that did it. <laughs> they play stuff like this on there, like all the time and just old Shaw brothers stuff and you know, yeah stuff like this and just really wild things and stuff, uh, in the, in the culture that we may not understand, we're, we're, we're all in for it though. So so I will say that, of course, you know, I've been out of the loop for a little bit. And during my downtime with the surgery I had to have, I watched a ton of Shaw Brother movies. I mean, that was kind of my 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 comfort, my my chicken noodle soup for getting over everything was just watching a bunch of martial arts stuff. <laughs> nice. So, so you're you're all in this review. Then. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah. But this has been the one, you know, for 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 this particular beef anniversary episode. On the next Beefversary episode and Crippled Theater you should hear is Ricky and I discussing Mr. No Legs, which you oh, know yeah. about that movie. Yes. <laughs> it's about a guy who gets fucked over by the mob and he turns his wheelchair because he's an amputee and he's an amputee and it's titled Mr. No Legs uh, into a killing machine. So, <laughs> Show looking enough. forward to watching that movie again. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. But um, That's it for this one. Thank you, Rick, sir. Yes, sir. Anytime, man. Love it. Yeah, we'll be back with something else. The city council of Blaine gave me the responsibility of putting together a show to celebrate the 150th anniversary of Blaine. I took the whole history of the town and I squeezed it like a piece of fresh bread. I think the uh, one really important thing that I learned in working with Corky is that I do indeed have Talent. My booby made a kishka. She made it big and fat. My Zeta took one look at it and said, I can't eat that. I have found here in Blaine a gold mine of talent. <coughs> I think Johnny would be so perfect, don't you? He could be the next Keanu Reeve. <laughs> We've got Ron and Sheila on board again. Midnight at the Newcomer Alan Pearl. I have a very lazy eye, which these uh, prescription glasses help. Libby. I've been working here at the DQ for about. Um... And of course, Lloyd and I, it's like rams butting heads. Certainly, Corky has brought something to our little theatrical community. He's definitely um, different. You know, he can just do everything there is to do, and there's only one other person in the world that can do that, and that's Barbara Streisand. I have a little announcement to make. Mort Guffman is going to come from New York City and see our show. 
We have one shot at this. We've got one performance with Mort Guffman coming to town. We need to hitch up our panties and run. As you heard from the trailer, uh, the next feature in this uh, beef anniversary Christopher Guest thing uh, celebration or whatnot is his first feature, uh, official feature, uh, Waiting for Guffman from 1996. Uh, your, your cheapo plot synopsis is this. Oh boy. Ooh, sorry. An aspiring director in the in the marginally talented amateur cast of a hokey small town Missouri musical production go overboard when they learn that someone from Broadway may be in attendance. Hence the title, Waiting for Guffman. Uh, speaking of which, um, tonight, uh, y'all are waiting on me. We have a special guest on, on this particular review, as they do all reviews. Um, Mr. Venom is here. How you doing, sir? Greetings and salutations, mockumentary fans. Yes, Gary, I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. And Iris is here. How you doing, babe? I am just doing wonderful. Just loving these mockumentaries because, I, man, I dig these movies. Yeah, good times, good times. Um, your your principal cast for for this one is a, is a pretty big one because um he, he keeps he keeps a lot of the same cast, which is what I love about these films is. They're all, my, my, uh, uh, all the stuff is not is not scripted. It's it's improvised. And if you do some a re- little bit a little bit of research on this, um, he shoots ten minute long scenes at a time w- without you know direction, and he ends up with almost sixty hours of film by the end of the by the end of the shoot, and he has to cut that down to ninety minutes. So take all these comedy people and letting them them work and then saying okay we're gonna keep this it has to be a difficult task to begin with but uh <laughs> your um principal cast christopher guest himself as corky st Clair, our, our uh our, our drama direct director um yeah good stuff eugene levy as dr alan pearl fred willard as rob albertson Catherine o'hara as sheila Al- sheila albertson Parker Posey as Libby Mae Brown, Louis Arquette as Clifford Woolley, uh, Bob Balaban, uh, my man, I love this guy, as Lloyd Miller, uh, M- Matt Kiesler as Johnny Savage, Michael Hitchcock as Steve Stark, Larry Miller as Mayor Glenn Welsh. It's hard. It's 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 um it's important to see a lot of these names because a lot are going to show up again in these other movies for sure. Um, s- small roles: uh, David Cross as the UFO expert. Paul Dooley as the UFO, UFO abductee. One of my favorite parts of this whole entire movie <laughs> involves him. <laughs> Brian Doyle Murray shows up for like a hot second. Oh my gosh. Linda Cash is Mrs. Pearl. I love her character. Um, yeah, fil- filmed in Texas. Not in, um, in, in in Blaine, Missouri, where this film is supposedly taking place, which is a... I, I, I love... I love what he does here, especially with this and like Best in Show and anything he does. He takes an, an idea, you know, this idea of a small town who who's famous for one thing, and they're oh so proud of this one thing, and they just blow the shit up. And it, it's 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 amazing. <laughs> I, I I forgot to mention that the the music and lyrics are um, written by um, um, Christopher Guest. Michael McKeon and Harry Shearer don't show up in this movie at all. Um, but they show, they'll show up in the next one. Um, I, I'll start with, with, with Venom. Go for it, man. Waiting for government. This is the first time watching me, by the way. Oh, wow. Really? Um, no, definitely not a first time watch for me. Um, I've been a fan of Christopher Guest since, um, well, really since Spinal Tap, even though I know he didn't you know, write and direct Spinal Tap. I mean, just watching their performances, the main three guys, McKeon, Shearer, and Guest as the band, just absolutely blew me away, uh, made me an absolute fan of the mockumentary style of filmmaking, and it just makes sense that I followed Christopher Guest's career along the way. So Waiting for Guffman... This is one I would have seen, you know, less than a year after its release. I wasn't quite going to see every Christopher Guest movie in theaters. It probably wasn't until Best in Show that I started that streak. And at this point, I haven't missed any since. Waiting for Guffman is an odd animal, though. Um, 
I, I love all of the Christopher Guest films, all the mockumentaries. I mean, hell, I, I'll even, you know, go to bat for mascots, which I know a lot of people kind of poo-pooed uh, a few years ago. Um, but this one, it, 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 I find this one to be the most emotional and the least funny of his films. Now, I'm not saying the film is not funny. The film is hysterical. But you have to realize that there are films out there like Best in Show and A Mighty Wind that literally leave my stomach hurting when the when the film is over. This one, because of some of the quirky characters, because of some of the more kind of sad situations that some of these characters are going through, it injects a little bit more reality into the film than something like A Spinal Tap or A, a Mighty Wind. And that kind of tends to bring down the comedic factor of the film. Um, in a sense that, you know, we watch a Christopher Guest movie to laugh, not to feel sad for characters, you know, decisions and choices, you know, things like that. Um, the movie is still incredibly well performed. It is incredibly funny. I mean, this cast, as with all of Christopher Guest films, casts are stellar, not just the main players, but even the secondary roles as well. The, 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 um, the journeyman actors and actresses that he gets to be in his films is just amazing. Uh, you know, the comedy is still there and it's still on point. I think the reason that I look at Waiting for Guffman is one of my lesser favorite guest movies is because of my lack of interest in the subject matter. When we go back and look through all the films that he's done, you know, best in show. I've been married to a veterinarian for 26 years. So, of course, by association, I love animals and I love best in show. Um, Spinal Tap, again, not a Christopher Guest direct film, but, you know, I, I'm obviously, you know, a heavy metal dude. I've, you know, the, the attitude, the lifestyle, it's always worked for me. A Mighty Wind, even though I'm not a fan of folk music, I am still a musician and a fan of playing live. So to actually see the ins and outs of putting this show together was extremely entertaining for me. Now, musical theater is something I've never been the biggest fan of. I, at no point in my life have I ever been a fan of musical theater. And I think because of my lack of interest in that topic, this one doesn't always work for me as much. Um, still, Like I said, it's still an amazing film. The, the mere, I mean, the triumph of this film is the fact that it's done without a script, you know, the fact that for the most part, only the songs were written when they were going, you know, into the production of this one. You know, they had some scenarios in mind here and there, but no actual lines. And allowing this group of actors to kind of, you know, ad lib or improv the entire film and still come up with something this funny and this entertaining is an absolute triumph. Now, obviously, I, as I've already said, I feel like a couple of other examples of guest films kind of nail the aesthetic a little bit more. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a Mighty Wind guy. Uh, Mighty Wind is probably my favorite Christopher Guest movie, and it was not upon first watch. That, that basically came about over 20 years of watching every Christopher Guest movie in, incessantly. I own all of them, um, and I watch them constantly. They're all pretty much annual watches for me. Uh, a Mighty Wind, I tend to watch two or three times a year, actually. So, it, you know. Uh, my, the whole gist of the thing uh, of what I'm trying to say is, is that I love Christopher Guest films, but Waiting for Guffman is the one that I have the least attachment to, and I am very, you know, open to the fact that it's probably because I have no interest in musical theater. But still, an incredibly funny film, uh, an absolute must-watch for comedy fans, and you know, it, you know, it's it's required viewing if you're a fan of any kind of mockumentary-style filmmaking. So yeah. Still an absolute classic film. It's interesting that the way you describe, you know, you, you're the least interested I in this to... one. Oh, so go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, Gary. No, that he's the least interested in, you know, the subject matter of this one. I, I think Chris Brigitte's ability and the people that are involved in his in his films, their their ability to, to make me care about the subject matter is a pretty magical thing, I think. I don't know what it is. But... Absolutely. I mean, I like I said, the fact that I have such little interest in that subject matter, yet still watch Waiting for Guffman every year or a couple of years, says something to Christopher Guest's filmmaking and, you know, just how he shoots his scenes, you know, like you said, shooting these long scenes and then editing the best parts of them together. That is the triumph of this movie is in its filmmaking. And, um, you know, like I said, Despite me having no interest in musical theater, I can still watch this movie and enjoy it. Um, I just want to, you know, 
let it be known that it is definitely one of my lesser, uh, you know, it, movies. It's the one that I gravitate towards the least. When I feel like a Christopher Guest movie, it's not likely going to be waiting for Guffman. Gotcha. Iris, I'm sorry. Go ahead, girl. Oh, what? Iris? I think she hit herself on mute, maybe. Are you there, Venom? It doesn't look, doesn't look like she's muted. I don't know. She's not talking. Yes, sir. I'm just making sure you're there, because she, she, she's... Yeah, uh, she's not muted. She's not talking. Uh, I mean, maybe she's in the process of getting disconnected. Could be, could be. My, my internet's been going crazy all day because of the... I think it's because of the terrible weather we've been having. It's been raining and threatening to rain all day. Oh, yeah. there we go. Yeah, we she got bumped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I knew it. Oh. Like I was telling the guys in the, in the group, though, I, I, I try, I'm trying to keep you guys abreast of when we're doing the next one, so if you want to happen to jump on the next ones... I, it's, yeah, I uh, saw that. Yeah, it just, you just gotta go by the. Uh, Monday is already Fresh Cuts night for me. Gotcha. Yeah, Thursday um, was Thursday. Thursday I may be open. Okay. Yeah, Thursday is a uh, best in the show with Bo, and um, I think sometime that weekend yeah, is gonna be a mighty wind with Scott. I gotta hit up Scott to see where where he's available and when they're where they're available, and it's all gotta line oh, up. And nice. I hate the fucking scheduling so much, <laughs> but um, it's like hey, yeah, I'll do I'll dire. do it though. Yeah. <laughs> Um, couldn't do what Duncan does, though. Fuck no. Wouldn't, wouldn't fucking want it. Oh, hell no. No, 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 no. No way. I, I need to have a life. I might drop. way too much poker to podcast and edit as much as Duncan does. I may, um, I may drop out of Summer Series, though, because I'm trying to get all my little houses in order here just to, I haven't released much, and that's, um, my fault, and I'm trying to get, um, trying to get abreast with all my, my co-hosts and get it going on. We have a regular day for two drink room commentaries now, so that's going to help things. And mm-hmm. like I said, I'm going to record some surplus shows with some guys. So if you're interested, Venom, to doing some surplus shows with me, uh, I'll be looking for some co-hosts for those. And um, I'm not sure what those are going to be yet, but I just want to get some in the can so I can not bug Iris and Suzanne so much. Yeah, oh, definitely. I'll keep you um, informed. I'm available, I'm always down. I'll keep you informed um what that's gonna be in Thank you. Yeah. Oh, no, I got my phone on. I don't think I have my phone on, so let me fix that problem. <sighs> what did I just do here? Oh, excuse me. What are you guys doing next time? No room in hell. Oh, what are we doing? Um The Ruins and Atrocious. <sighs> which is uh, Atrocious is a Spanish found footage movie. I gotcha. I knew what the ruins was. I wasn't And then sure the about ruins, that of course, the yeah. classic. What's that? I knew what the ruins was. I wasn't sure about the other one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a weird one. It's kind of obscure. Not a lot of people have seen it. Um, like I said, it's just a, it's a weird found footage movie, you know, and it's in Spanish, so it's probably not anything that American horror fans are going to kind of seek out. But it's one that I enjoyed when I saw it a couple of years ago, so this is basically a revisit for me. I don't want to read the movie, damn it. I'm that kind of American person. No, I, I, hey, no, I, re- own, I read the movie all the time. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Hi. So um, I was talking that whole time and uh, then realized that I wasn't even on the call anymore. Yeah, you got cut off, yeah. Yeah. So... We we, we we basically didn't get anything of yours, so you could just start over. Oh, okay. Well, I will start all over again. (laughs) Okay, so for me, um, I love theater. I love live theater. I've, I've done live theater, so this movie is a lot of fun for me. Uh, the way the characters are and um, the dynamic between all of them, how Ron, uh, you know, wants to loosen up Dr. Perlman and, um, oh, you know, just, just the way they are um, and just the running gags in this whole thing, um, like Ron's uh, peculiar surgery that he had to have. <laughs> so good. Um, oh, my God. That and is of the, course, one of the greatest screw the audience jokes ever. Right, right. And it's like, here, you know, you're a doctor, right? <laughs> it's like, no, 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 no. Oh, my gosh. And, and the, the, the Chinese restaurant scene. Oh, my God. That is the best scene right there where, you know, of course, Sheila's like, so what's it like, you know, doing, you know, being with an uncircumcised man? <laughs> And of course, the pearl, you know, the pearls, the doctor pearl, just, you know, Ellen and, and, and his wife are like, um, so, you know, so yeah, the egg rolls are really good. <laughs> Can we have some coffee, please? Coffee here. 
Oh my gosh, but just that conversation there, and then of course Ron relents and and you know stands up and starts undoing his pants so Doctor Perlman can look at his penis. I mean, <laughs> and okay, so of course this movie was back in what 1996, and uh, the jokes that you know uh, Alan Pearl says of like you know, ooh, happy squaw in wampum, or, you know, and stuff. And I'm like, mm. yeah. and of course, you know, stuff like that would not fly very well now, but... Even, even, the even his mild racism is mild, is pretty entertaining. Right? Exactly. <laughs> it is fucking hilarious. So, uh, and one of my favorite scenes also is when, um, <laughs> when, when uh, Lloyd Miller, which I love his name, uh, basically goes, uh, so Corky's gone? And the show is mine now. I'm going to be in there. They're like, no! So they all take off running, looking for Corky. And this scene always reminds me of uh, when they go looking for the two ghosts in the attic in Beetlejuice. Mm -hmm. It's the same fucking scene, man. (laughs) Because they're all running up the stairs and they're all banging on the door and trying to figure out what's going on in there. And then... One of them's like, no, no, stop, stop. Just leave him alone. It's the same exact scene. And that always cracks me up because it's like, I- I'm watching Beetlejuice. What am I watching here? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, there's just a lot in this whole thing. And of course, just these little snippets, right? Like Paul Dooley, that. <laughs> <laughs> so they put us in these different rooms and then I got probed and then all of them came in and they all probed me not all at the same time <laughs> and it's like, and, and no, ever, ever ever since this, I just don't feel my buttocks <laughs> just don't feel his buttocks oh it's so good it's like a little minute gag but I can't stop laughing you know well, mm. all of them are right and of course you've got the UFO David Cross when he is like you know Blaine if you scramble up the world you know the words it's Nelby or something <laughs> You know, I was just waiting for him to go, it's aliens. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, you know, and I think this is, like you guys were saying, this is the genius of of this filmmaking, right? To be able to do, have these wonderful comedians do these long scenes and then go and edit and put everything together where it is a coherent movie that you can follow along is just fucking amazing to me. And and the way they break the fourth wall, too. Because it's a mockumentary, so you know that they're talking to the screen. But it kind of makes you feel not like you are in it with them, but like you are an actual character sitting, watching them, you know, do all this wacky rehearsing and actually sitting in the audience there with them, you know? So I think that's... It's just a wonderful movie. And, of course, the final gag of Waiting for Guffman, you know, um, it's, it of course, you know, it's kind of like a playoff of Waiting for Godot. Uh, but <laughs> it, it it's just hilarious when, when they all realize that they have acted and sang their little hearts out and <laughs> it just didn't pan out the way they thought it was going to. I, it's hilarious. Just fucking hilarious. And I I just love this movie. I, I love I, I, so many things about this movie, but what what, what um, Christopher Guest does with Parker Posey in all these movies, I, I, I know her f- first and foremost from Days of Confused in, in films like that, where she's like the assertive, dominant female type, but he turns her into these like, these like almost like pathetic characters in a way, like very, very humble. They have like a, like a, like a past you're not sure about, but sometimes you know about and this one is is just the girl who, who who sort of has big dreams who happens to work at the Dairy Queen, and that if it doesn't pan out, well at least the Dairy Queen will take me back. You know, it just it's it's one of those small town that's, things. That's you know? one of the scenes in the film. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. but that's one. Of, it's funny because that's one of the scenes in the movie that actually kind of depresses me. The fact that she's sitting there with a defeatist attitude and just accepting the fact that well. I guess the Dairy Queen will always have me. It's like, oh, my God, that's such a terrible attitude. I mean, you know, it's a small town, and I understand, you know, big dreams don't come often, but, man. It's, it's a like small a, town dream, right? Exactly. No, but big time. And, you know, and I appreciate the fact that actors will bust their hump to, you know, get this stuff made, um, make it as as entertaining as possible, everything else. But, man, 
Um, this is one of the things, uh, this is another thing about this movie that kind of doesn't entertain me as much as some of the past ones. It's uh, what I like to call the post-event scene. In all of the Christopher Guest movies, there's always one big event that they're leading up to. Obviously, in Best in Show, and it's the dog show. In, in A Mighty Wind, it's, it's the big show at Town Hall. Um, and then there's the scenes afterward, like, what are they doing now? And in, Do in Best in Show and A Mighty Wind, they're not nearly as depressing. They're, like, they're, they're a lot more joyful and, and, you know, and funny a lot of the times. In this movie, it seems like everyone is worse off after the show. Um, you know, uh, Fred and Catherine O'Hare move to Hollywood. They don't have a car. <laughs> they can't afford to do anything. Um, obviously, Parker Posey, you know, moving back in with her dad, her ex-con dad, and going back to the Dairy Queen. Even Corky telling the horror stories of him moving back to New York and, you know, why he did it and everything else. This movie, as much as I like this movie and I laugh throughout, it always tends to leave me a little sad at the end. And that's probably why it's one that I don't always gravitate towards. Um, I, I, I want to be left with that funny bone kind of tingling when I walk away from a comedy. I don't, I don't want to kind of be a little sad. And, and again, this is just... Um, it's just showing the great filmmaking of Christopher Guest once again, because he can make a comedy feel legitimately sad at times. And, you know, again, that, that's a that's a great thing. It sounds like I'm complaining about it. I'm not necessarily complaining. I'm just saying that I personally, when I go into a Christopher Guest movie, I want to laugh beginning to end. And not to say that I'm not laughing beginning to end here, but there's enough of those sad post event scenes that just it leaves me a little sad is all. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's the beauty of this whole thing, though, right? Because you kind of get invested in these characters. Yes, absolutely. And all his movies, I get invested yeah, in these characters. Yeah, ex very <laughs> much so. I'm sorry, Gary. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. No, I think it's important, you know, because every kid wants that remains of the day, you know, lunchbox, as um, Corky <laughs> describes, you know. And, Brad Pack bubbleheads, right? Oh, man. God. I actually would love one of those porky hand towels. I would, I would display that in my house. <laughs> no, the, the whole the whole ca character of Corky Saint Clair, you, 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 from from like the hair and the, the the way he acts, and you know, he's look, is is he heterosexual? You, you really don't know because he hires this mechanic to be an actor. He's being really flirty with his mechanic, and you know, I mean, he claims to have. <laughs> yes, he claims that life. I've I've never seen her before, but um, maybe she's out of town or something. You know, it's a uh, um, it's a real small small part of the film, but like the whole theater thing. And he's this guy who's you know straight out the destroyer to New York City, you know, without a penny in her pocket. Yada 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 yada. And it's it's it 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 it, it, it seems like it, this is his home, but he, where he's from because he, he's forced to come back here. But um. We still kind of live in the the, the broad the, the off 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 Broadway's pra you know dream. Yeah, it's, it's 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 like 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 Venom said. It, there's 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 a, a sense of patheticness here, which kind of makes you sad. But you're you're emotionally invested in these characters. Yeah, even Michael Hitchcock's character. You know, where he's this guy that that's help 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 helps run the town. I forget what exactly his, his title is, but he. <laughs> He wants to be in the show so bad, but he can't be in the show because the mayor said that he had to work that day to do the audition. But he still really wants to be in the show. And right, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's 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 a really fun time. And I, but but like like Venom said, this is not one that I, I watched it for the first time for the show. I really I really enjoyed myself, you know, as much as the other ones. But there is there is that sense of depression, you know, for these characters. That, that makes you not not want to go back to it. I mean, you step stepping like best in show. They're pathetic for different reasons. I mean, they're, 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 I mean, Parker Posey's character is well off in the movie, you know, with, with, her, with her husband, but they have a lot of problems, clearly, you know, with themselves and, and, and their fucking dog. With the, the, oh which my God, the which dog. proves, you know, you could, you could be well off and be miserable at the same time, but with them not being aware that you're miserable, you know? Um, How could you forget his toy? How could you forget the bumblebee? Uh, so oh, good. That scene. 
When she accuses that uh, hotel staff member of stealing her dog oh, toy, I just flipped God. out. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what she wants to steal from you, a dog toy. Uh-huh. <laughs> She's that kind of... And it's funny, too, because it's like now we live in a world of Karens, and I look at that scene in a completely oh. different context now. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it was funny before. It's still a little insipid. But now I look at it as, oh, there's the entitled white woman accusing the minority of stealing from her. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> dog toy. I'm not going to say it's problematic in any way. It's just, it, it's one of those things in the back of my head that I think about now. Like, holy shit, Parker Posey's a Karen. <laughs> um. Yeah, there's there's a lot. I, I forget to mention that the whole plot of this film is them for them to put on this play for their 150th anniversary of this town. And the reason why it's called Waiting for Guffman, uh, Corky gets a letter f- from I forget where. But it basically says there's, there's like a Broadway scout that's going to come out and watch the show. So they're all waiting for their big break that, unfortunately, Guffman never comes. And they're still they're still waiting. But um, f- filled with 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 songs that that, that that will stay in your head, and it, it, it songs about you know, and I, I just made me laugh when what I what I again it's just part of the dialogue that Blaine Missouri is the stool capital of of, of the USA, and what when I hear the word even stool, a hint of irony. <laughs> yeah, when I hear stool, you know, you think of shit, and you know, it's just right, right. I don't know, man. I, I don't know why I thought of that like right, right right away, but you know, this being as small a town as it is, then being this excited about the biggest claim to fame is that uh, President McKinley came in on his on his iron horse, a train, to it, it, it stopped there by mistake or something, and they gave him the gift of a stool. And ever since then, this was their their top industry was making these stools and them making this play about this again there's a level there's a level there's a level of patheticness here that y- y- you're endeared by but at the same time you feel bad for these people so it it, it leaves you w- with that feeling of you know how am i supposed to feel here it, you, you don't know how you're supposed to feel <laughs> and I, that's what i kind of literally love about this movie and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna watch it more more times for sure but uh <laughs> I mean, right from the opening scene, it sets up the idiocy of this town. I mean, literally, they're talking about setting up snipers to deter kids from throwing (laughs) eggs. Are you serious? You're going to answer egg throwing with murder? Holy crap. (laughs) And we can't have the porta potty too far away because the seniors can't Uh, get there and die. (laughs) (laughs) They can't make it. (laughs) Well, it is the stool Uh, capital of the world, right? (laughs) Yeah. It all goes back to shit. Does <laughs> uh, I do got to say though, and I and I know this is probably part of the comedy of the whole thing, but man, did Corky overreact to that letter? I mean, all the letter said was that they were sending a scout to kind of watch their show. That was it. And instantly, Corky tells the rest of the production, "We might go, we might go to Broadway." It's like, whoa! How did you? Get- get that out of that one telegram from you know this agency it's like yes he's coming down yes he's gonna watch it might give you some pointers some notes things like that but corky of all people should have known that you know that that more uh guffman isn't coming down there potentially with a contract to sign them to broadway you know what i mean it's a little overzealous on corky's part but again that's probably part of the comedy so i tend to accept it (laughs) Yeah, it's it's very. I mean, like you said, the whole thing just starts off the wall <laughs> a bit. Yeah. And I mean, even the town itself, the existence of the town itself is a bit off the wall, though, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Do you smell that salt air? And they're like, "Oh, we're in California." <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> oh my God, that that should be the back the backstory for like the Simpsons Springfield or something. Right? Exactly. That, it sounds exactly. idiotic. Jebediah. <laughs> He smelled salt and said, "Hey, we're in California. We're in California. Oh, yeah. oh my God!" And and, and the, the whole thing of and he, you know he he managed to you know convince him for a couple of months. <laughs> that it was low tide. <laughs> it was low tide. <laughs> oh God damn it! <laughs> well, they just decided to stay there. <laughs> And name the town after him. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> and 
and, and damn, is if that councilwoman isn't proud to be, you know, well, that was my great 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 grandfather. I'm like, mm, I don't know if I'd be proud of that, but she, she's one of the original Blaine, one of the original Blaines, you know. Yeah. Uh, oh man, yeah. I, you know, I, I. I may be talking about how this is one of my least favorite Christopher Guest movies, but that doesn't mean that it's not wall-to-wall laughs throughout. It's just, um, you know, maybe the laughs don't always resonate with me as much as some of his other films. But, I mean, don't let it be denied. This movie is still an absolute comedy classic. It's it's still incredibly funny, incredibly well-made, and well, well worth anyone's time. Um, like I said, I don't I don't want to make it sound like I'm coming in negative on the movie. Not at all. I still, still really, really, really like this movie. To say that it's my least favorite Christopher Guest is actually a compliment because I do love the movie. I own it. I own the Blu-ray. Like I said, I tend to watch it periodically still. It's just not the one that I watch the most. So, I mean, that says a lot about, you know, my feelings for Christopher Guest and his filmmaking. It's not your go-to. Exactly. It's just not my go-to. That's all. I prefer Friday the 13th Part 4 to Friday the 13th Part 7. Doesn't mean I there don't still love Part 7. <laughs> there you go. Um, I think and this is a fun thing. Oops, of... oh, I'm sorry. I was, I was just going to say that if you own the Blu-ray, there's also a lot of great scenes that were cut out. Obviously, I mean, you know, we already have mentioned multiple times about he how he had over 60 hours of footage to put into a hour and 25 minute long movie. So there's obviously going to be some great, great scenes that are cut out. But yeah, there, there's still a couple of really, really like classic, almost one-liners and great scenes. Like I really wish they would have put the Fred Willard and Catherine O'Hare baseball scene in the movie. I absolutely love that scene. Basically, Fred Willard's character, we don't really find out in the theatrical version of the movie, but in the, in the deleted scenes, we find out that he's a big baseball buff, like a historian, like a baseball historian. And he actually recreates the last at bat of the 1960 World Series. And what's great about it is that he's enthusiastic and smiling and telling the story, but his wife, Catherine O'Hare, is drunk out of her mind and <laughs> constantly just rolling her eyes every time he states a new fact to the point where um, he actually asks her to come and, you know, because they're playing with a wiffle ball and a wiffle bat, and he basically asks her to come and pitch, uh, you know, uh, give him a nice easy pitch to hit so that he can recreate that last at bat of that World Series, the Pittsburgh Pirates, of course, winning that one. And she, the first time she throws the ball, she throws it right at his damn head because she's just got this look of, I don't want to deal with your shit right now. You know, her eyes are half closed. She looks like she'd rather be anywhere else in the world. And then finally she gives him a pitch that he could hit. He, you know, he does his hitting it out of the park and running around the bases. And she literally just walks out of the scene in frustration. And you can still see her way in the background as he continues, as Fred Willard's character continues to talk about baseball. And she's way in the background, just like, when will he shut up? Oh, God. <laughs> that is the scene I really like. It's a little bit long. It's like a six-minute scene, which is going to add a lot, but... Uh, to, you know, to the duration of the film. But man, do I wish they left that in there. There's also another deleted scene with Corky um, telling the story of Wales for some reason. And he ends the story with one of the greatest one-liners that I'm so upset is not in the actual film. He looks dead in the camera and says, I'd love to ride the back of a sperm whale, among other things. Oh, my God. It's literally the gayest thing he said in the whole production, and they cut it out of the movie. I was so upset. It's so funny. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, and then the, the, the now the reason why I, I, I tend to say that even these deleted scenes aren't as good as some of the ones from like Best in Show and um, Mighty Wind is because uh, in the deleted scene is the full production of Red, White and Blaine. It's literally a 40 minute play. What we get in like, what, five, six, seven minutes in the theatrical version is actually a 40 minute scene. And some of the songs, and I'm going to point out one specifically, the, the boring song, the one about nothing ever happens in Blaine. Mm -hmm. The whole version of that song is absolutely insipid and unlistenable. Like, I wanted to pull my damn ears off halfway through the song. I, it, it's just so great that Christopher Guest knows exactly how much of a bad song to leave in the movie so that it's still entertaining and not irritating. Because holy shit, that whole song is irritating. <laughs> but yeah, well worth you know, well worth a Blu-ray purchase just to get these deleted scenes. There's over a half hour of them. 
Um, I think it's like 34 minutes total of just deleted scenes. And then the commentary with Christopher Guest and Eugene Levy is absolutely classic. So yeah, well worth your, you know, 10, 15 bucks. Highly recommend. <laughs> nice. Nice. Um, yeah, I just love how, how quirky in this movie is so out of place with everybody else. And every, everywhere he goes, I mean, he, he claims to have a wife so he can, he can shop for women's clothes and they not be looked upon as weird. But he has, just to describe his look, he has a bowl of haircut with his beard going on and he has a lisp. So that doesn't tell you anything that's stereotypically, you know, homosexual, possibly, you know. <laughs> Don't forget the earring. In the, in the earring, <laughs> yes. Like the gauge in his uh, ear. Yeah. <laughs> to, to the point, I, I, I love it. It's a real small fucking thing. We mentioned Brian Doyle, Brian Doyle Marie shows up in this movie. When he goes to, to, to the mechanic shop to, 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 get, to get the young, to get the young, you know, I guess thing to be in the play, Brian Doyle Marie gives him this look like, you know, why you look? Why you looking at my son like that? Queer, basically, you know. Right. It's like who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> it's like, uh, did you put that fan belt on that car? Uh, look. <laughs> so yeah, little little shit like that. I I I, I can't get enough of. Um... Brian Brian Doyle Mur Murray is one of those guys that makes me laugh just by standing there. I don't know what mm -hmm. it is about him. But he doesn't even need a line. Like, when he was just standing there staring at his son while Corky was asking him to be in the show, I was losing it. I, I'm just like, holy shit, that is some great face acting right there. And I see it all the time with him. Because he, he's never really been, like, the star of a film. He's always, like, a, you know, a, a second player in the film. But any film that he's in... It just, he ends up stealing the scene. He steals the scene in Scrooged oh, yeah. when he actually is playing opposite his son in the flashback scene. I just, man, uh, he he is an underappreciated treasure. <laughs> Why don't you get a job and get a choo-choo? <laughs> so good. Exactly. God. <sighs> but, um... Oh, I forgot to mention, there's actually a great deleted scene on here. Um, it's, it, this is a, one of the long ones. It's, it's, like a, it's almost like an eight-minute long deleted scene. But basically, it's Corky going around to all the different homes and places of business, businesses to let the actors know they got the role. Uh, apparently, Corky doesn't call people. He doesn't do telegrams or anything. He literally likes to do it face-to-face. -face. So, like, in, at the beginning of the scene, he pulls up to the drive through at Dairy Queen, orders a Coke... And then, you know, let's Parker Posey know that she got the role. Uh, everybody in the in the Dairy Queen goes crazy. He then goes to um, the travel agency with uh, Catherine O'Hare and Fred Willard. With them, because they've worked in productions together, he doesn't even get out of his car. He literally pulls up to the front of their travel agency, beeps the horn, and then just gives the thumbs up and drives away. And you could see Fred and Catherine, you know, do their little bit of a celebration. Um, and then the scene ends with him going to Eugene Levy's dentist office. And that that's the high point of the scene, because Eugene Levy is literally in the middle of giving anesthetic to a, an older gentleman. He looks like an octogenarian. And he literally, as soon as Corky walks in and tells him that he got the role, you know, he starts freaking out. He didn't think he had a chance, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then ends up forgetting about the old man in the chair with the mask, with the CO2 mask still on his head. Hopefully the man didn't die. We don't see <laughs> the rest of it, but it just literally the fact that at the end of the scene, he walks out the door and says, oh, I forgot about this guy. <laughs> he still had the CO2 mask on his face. Or, excuse me, the, um, not CO2, excuse me. It's the, the nitrogen. Guy. Nitrogen, thank you. CO2, I'm thinking of fucking cars. Yeah, well, I'm like, yeah, he's dead if he had CO2. Yes, yeah, he's breathing <laughs> CO2, that old guy's dead. dead. <laughs> oh, yeah, like I said, this, this goddamn movie. I would love to see, like, a three- or four-hour cut of this movie. Assuming there was enough funny scenes filmed, I... I this would be a Saturday afternoon I would love to spend, you know, with any of his films, um, with the full versions, with, like, all the footage. Obviously, everything's not going to be gold. There's, there's going to be plenty of takes that where nothing is funny or the actors couldn't think of a good line, whatever the case may be. But anything that's even mildly entertaining, I mean, he could probably put, like, a three- or four-hour cut of some of his films together, and it would still be endlessly entertaining. So, I, you know, for chance to dream. <laughs> I totally agree with you, man. I th I think that Dr. Pearl, uh, Eugene Levy, is probably the least pathetic one, you know, coming out at the end of this, because 
even when the play was shut down, he's like, well, I just went back to my life again of, you know, being, being a doctor and, you know, I, I hope it goes back, but if it doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's not, not that big of a deal to him, but you know. You could see, you could see the heartbreak. You could see the heartbreak in his eyes because it was, he was finally doing what he wanted to do all his life. But, and he got taken away from him. But, but even Parker Posey, you know, yeah, Libby, go sick right. I was just going to say, um, Eugene Levy is another one that, thank God, they didn't include this deleted scene in the theatrical version. But in in the deleted scene, um, uh, in the more extended cut of his post interview, um, he actually does let us know that is that he and his wife separated because she had no interest in moving to Miami for him to become a uh, lounge singer. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it, it's like he takes it well. He's like, well, I'm living my dream. I don't have my wife, but I'm living my dream. So I guess that's a good thing. So he still has a good attitude about it. But I just feel bad that you know he kind of lost his wife just because he wanted to you know follow his dream. Kind of sucks. <laughs> I mean, I mentioned, you know, that Parker Posey's kind of pathetic in this movie in, in a sense that she she has the Dairy Queen to look forward to. But there, there's that one small scene where she's describing what she does at Dairy Queen. And, you know, she's kind of proud that, that she puts blizzards yeah. together. So it's not like she's thinking this is a bad thing. It's just, you know, when she, like you said, there's that, that, that crestfallen moment for for all these people. To where she said, "Well, I guess I can, they'll, they'll always take it back at the Dairy Queen," but she she had she had pride this job, it, it, even though it's it's a small no, thing to to the point of when she moves back to go live with her father in in Alabama or something. I think this is Alabama that she goes to work at another Dairy Queen. It's like, yeah, this is just something she likes to do. Yeah, you know, make people happy with with ice cream. And I think it's funny that you mentioned there's a deleted scene where. The way he tells her she got the play was to go to the drive thru and get a Coke. That's one of the things that she mentions in her little, you know, I have pride that I work at Dairy Queen speech. It's like, yeah, if, you wanna, if you're just thirsty, you come get a Coke at the drive thru. You know, it's, it's, it's one of the small things, you know? Absolutely. No, definitely. You know, I would never think to call any of these people quote unquote losers. Not at all. I no. mean, if they're happy in their life, then they're happy. And hell, they're happy. They're, they're probably happier than most of us living in a house making good money. So, yeah. you know, rock on to them. <laughs> no, I forgot this. The part in the, the beginning of the play, where the first song, and, and Corky doesn't want the doctor to wear his glasses because they didn't exist in 18, whatever the hell it is. Oh, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he's explaining the one, he, he's got the one crossed eye because the, the, the glasses fixed us. But when they put that big, they put the, that fucking big uh, amount of guy liner on the guys in these movies, and he has it all up in his eyes, that crossed eye just sticks out like a sore thumb and I can't stop laughing. Yeah, that like, is the most epic lazy eye I have ever seen. That that was amazing. <laughs> Oh, man, this is just a little shit, man. It makes you laugh in this movie. No, it's true. This movie is, I mean, this along with all Christopher Guest movies are just filled with these little moments that, you know, we all end up falling in love with, either because they're, you know, charming, heartwarming, or just because they're butt-gustingly funny. And, you know, again, the genius of Christopher Guest, you know, in, in, at display uh, here and for many more films after this, too. So I'm glad he didn't have a short career because I love my mockumentaries. Stool capital of the USA. Hey, uh, I would, I, I would be, I would consider myself a happy man if I could visit the stool capital of the United States. <laughs> I don't know. I think it'd be a little shitty. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh God, you walked right into that one. There you yeah, go. That was not planned. I did not plan <laughs> on setting her up that well. <laughs> you stepped into that really well. Oh, she's still going. <laughs> um, yeah. but much God like... Damn it, I miss podcasting with you guys. <laughs> I do. I mean, you know, me too, man. You do. <laughs> A lot of films like this, you know, the the, oh, the budget was $4 million. It only made $2.9 billion. $4 million only made $2.9 million um, in the box office. But, you know, it, 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 this had a following that, that, that I, I've heard about for years. Mm -hmm. And... I've never seen it before. I know a lot of my friends who are in musical theater, uh, whether in high school or, or beyond. And I work the stage crew, so I've seen a lot of these personalities, you know, pop, pop out like this, you know, divas, semi-stars, you know, you know, wh whatever you want to call it. But, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. It's like in every, every one of these movies, 
where the characters they're portraying are not that far off from the real thing. And I've, I've known people who have had show... My, my friend's mother was in the show dog, you know, industry and best in show, much like, you know, Spinal Tap for Musicians is hard to watch sometimes because the whole idea of them getting lost on, on the way to the stage is a very <laughs> real thing. And the idea of the personalities of these people who have these fucking dogs is a very real thing. Uh, these musical theater people types, you know, li- like Corky, that they're they're not they're not non-existent. And if that's yeah. that's all he knows, that's all he cares about. And you know, if it doesn't go his way, um, he's literally gonna go bite his pillow apparently, because you know, just just throwing the gay shit out there again. You know, it, it, it's uh, man, it's it's so funny though. Oh, I'll, I'll kick yeah, it to I just I'll, I'll kick it to you, Venom. Uh, any uh, final thoughts? And um, ra- rating one to ten, sir. Oh, final thoughts. I mean, <clears throat> as with all Christopher Guest movies, it's an absolute comedy classic. Um, it may not make you laugh as much as some of his others, or this one might make you laugh more than his others, uh, depending on you know your interests and just how it hits you when you when you watch it. Um, still, great one-liners through and through. One last scene that I actually wanted to highlight before we finish off here was um, Fred Willard and Catherine O'Hare's audition. And part of the reason that I love this scene is that I recognize the dialogue. I'm old enough to recognize where that dialogue is coming from. Iris might be right there with me, but uh, basically uh, they sing Midnight at the Oasis, Mm -hmm. but they're also doing a live action like skit with dialogue while they're doing um, the song. Do you know where that dialogue comes from, Iris? Oh my God, it it sounds familiar, but... It's it's from a Taster's Choice commercial from 1979. Oh, my God. And the first time I watched this movie and I heard Catherine O'Hare speaking in the British accent and saying the lines, I'm like, wait a minute. Why is this so familiar? Like, I thought, I, you know, obviously, since I know nothing about musical theater, I thought it was actually, the first time I watched this movie, I actually thought it was part of the song Midnight at the Oasis. I thought that was just like a classic presentation of that song but no i find out later more recently really only over the last few years that this is actually a combination of midnight at the oasis which by the way they got to use because christopher guest is personal friends with the man who wrote the song so that's why they're able to song in the movie and then um the other thing is that the fact that it's combined with the dialogue from a taster's choice commercial it's such a quirky silly thing that most people won't notice but the fact that i noticed it just it blew my mind the first time I saw it. And I, honestly, very few people know where that dialogue comes from because, you know, not a lot of people watching uh, movies like this were around or at least were almost adults in 1979. Exactly, you know? so, exactly. Uh, but, oh, my goodness. <laughs> so cool. So anyway, um, rating, I mean, I, I'm not going to give this a low rating. Like I said, this this is not my I still recognize its brilliance. I recognize its comedic triumph. I recognize its amazing filmmaking. Um, just almost everything about it works for me in every way. Um, with, with the little minor caveats that I kind of discussed during the, this podcast. So I'm going to come in with this one with an 8.5 out of 10. Whereas most Christopher Guest movies for me are nines and above. Like I said, this one is just a half a step below, um, but still a very solid 8.5 out of 10. Cool. Iris. Okay. Well, for me, um, like I said, I do enjoy this one. I do enjoy this one a lot. Uh, It's quirky. Kind of like with you, Gary, I know a lot of people like this, Uh, you know, the overachiever uh, theater guy the one who wants to be funny but really isn't, the ones that, you know, like, well, we're in every production, so we are the king and queen of the theater. Every single person. Even the the jealous mu- the, the, the jealous uh, music director because he's the one that should be directing the show. Um, so it, it's, it's funny, it's quirky, it, it's real life to me at some points because it's, it's just such funny shit. Uh, so I am going to give this a nine. Nice. Yeah, I, I, again, it's first time watching me, so I don't want to give the rating too high. I, I do, I do really enjoy it. I, I'm with with Venom on that eight point five, and I, I'll say uh, one thing: uh, a fun devil bill with this. Uh, if you guys haven't seen it yet, please watch it soon. Is a uh, Hamlet two with Steve Coogan, where he plays a, a high school drama teacher who 
rights to play for, for Inner City Use, which is a sequel to Hamlet that involves time travel and, you know, and Jesus Christ. And it, it's just, it's just a, it's just a quirky comedy. And I, 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 I think they'd be really enjoyable together. And <laughs> I'm going to go watch that soon, actually. <laughs> I, I missed that fucking movie. But, uh, this, this one, um, it fits, again, I just watched it today for the first time and it already, it fits right in the pantheon of the rest of these. It just, it just, it just fits there. And I think it's that the people involved and them being able to work together, because that helps, you know, that the chemistry of the actors, if they didn't have that, it, it would never work uh, amongst anything. And it, it works so well in this movie, even if it's not your favorite, like, like Venom said, because of the subject matter. But like I said, he, he makes you give a shit about the subject matter. And that's hard for me to say, especially with like a mighty wind, to make me give a shit about folk music. But I gave a shit about folk music by the when that movie was over. Oh. Yeah, exactly. But it, yeah, it's really enjoyable. 8.5. 8. And um, that's it for this one. Um, uh, we'll see you guys right after this break. This will keep you quiet. Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You call me Cutting a New Show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash legionpodcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. We appreciate it and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. Well, kids, did you enjoy the show? I, I sure as hell love making this show, and I, I think that, you know. All my love and all the people involved in this episode uh, has proven that. And I, I, I hate to say, use the word rejuvenating me as a podcaster, but you're, you're only good as your support team, in, in my opinion. That's why there's not many solo shows out there. So thank you, Ricky. Thank you, X. Thank you, Iris. Thank you, Mr. Venom. Uh, you'll hear some of these people on the next episode. Oh, and thank you to Suzanne. How, how dare I? Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, you'll hear some of these people... Uh, on the next episode, for sure, um, Bo Ransdell will be here w with Mr. Venom to discuss Best in Show with us and, and the full crew on that one. And at least one smoke show, Scott Crawford, will be here to discuss The Mighty Wind with us. And um, if you guys like that little jab in the middle there, the little little surprise, uh, Crippled Theater will we'll be back next episode. With Ricky Morgan, Rick, 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 Ricky Morgan, not of the Rock and Roll Express, Ricky Morgan of the Hail Ming Power Hour will be with me again to do Mr. No Legs. That will be there. Again, I can't, I can't express my gratitude any more than I can, you know, as I am right now. I mean, thank you for listening for all this time through, through hiatuses and lulls and my own stupid fucking brain not working correctly as far as depression and whatever goes but um love to you uh see you guys all next time on part two of the beef versus this is three parts people and remember here at the Sin beef podcast if you've got beef we've got the grinder see you next time <laughs>